Potheads and political junkies. Yo. You're watching Cannabis Culture News Live. I'm Jeremiah Vandermeer, editor of Cannabis Culture and Pot TV, and this is John Burfello. Yo, guys. P. With his, he brought his um, broccoli today, broccoli stems with him. I forgot the carb cap. Fuck, I hate it when I do Did that. You, is that cacti? That's cacti. What's the cacti all about? Let's get the cacti cam on here. Woohoo! A little Peruvian torch. A little Peruvian got, torch? It's got some nice stuff in there that I'm going to want to pump. Um, is that... You'll see it live on my channel. What do you get out of Peruvian Torch? Is that an it's ayahuasca a thing? deal or something? Mescaline, right, David? Mescaline? It's mescaline? I think that, yes, it's mescaline and that's San Pedro. The San Pedro. Spike. Yeah, sorry, it's San Pedro. We just that's San this. Pedro. Oh, David knows. David Malmo Levine in the audience, rolling a joint, making jokes about being gay. <sighs> he was supposed to be on this end of the <laughs> mic right here. You know, oral sex oh. might make your day, uh, but anal sex will make your whole week. Ugh. <laughs> uh, Yes, that one's a good one. It's too bad you don't have a microphone. You'll have to say that on when you get on the air. We're gonna, we don't need to repeat it. We don't need to repeat that one. You can repeat it, yes. So, I don't have a carb cap. Fuck. You don't have a carb cap. Got Can't you use the bottom of one of your things? That's plastic. See, this is a good little tip on the show that marijuana smokers should know, dabbers, that I'm those silicone cases make really good carb caps if you don't have a carb cap. Because they're not going to get too hot. Because you can get the heat up on those things really high. I was pointing to say, anybody got a silicone case? I see a large med tainer, jumbo med tainer. You know, actually, maybe I can use that. And use the. Well, how you doing, Pod TV? It's another Friday here. At it's a seven crazy West week in Canada. Yeah, this has been a brutal one. Brutal. Right now, uh, across this country, over the past few days, we have a situation where, unfortunately, a lot of our friends have been arrested. Even just in Nanaimo alone, 16, 16 arrests. 16 arrests at from three dispensaries. Yeah, Only like three four. that they raided, and they put 16 people in jail. They filled the lockup up. And uh, we have an interview with one of the fellows who was in jail, Rich Scott. Um, I talked to him earlier today, recorded an interview with him. He has the full story of what's been going on there uh, in Nanaimo. And I mean, what's happening in Nanaimo is happening all over the place now. Vernon. Seashell, Mission, Mission, Halifax. Well, they, okay, so here's it. We can go back into Mission a couple of weeks ago. So they went after uh, the BC Pain Society, and they went after Bob and his wife, and they've shut them down. The edible um, thing, right? The edible thing. Yeah. Um, and it had a lot more to do with that. So um, we, we don't know what's happening in Langley right now. I wouldn't mind getting a hold of Randy to see what's happening there, to be honest. But it seems like there, anything in an RCMP jurisdiction has, is, is on the forefront right now from Halifax right across Canada. Mm -hmm. Saskatchewan? And they always seem to happen on, I discussed this with you today, Jer, mm -hmm. on the 30th. Why? Because it's the day that everybody gets paid, so they have the most amount of money and yeah. probably product on hand so they can seize the amount. So I was, I'm seeing a consistency That's exactly that why these they do dates it on the 30th. always happen to happen yeah. on the 30th. Dave is looking. It's they, Wednesday. Yeah, or Welfare, Welfare Wednesday. Wednesday. No, so, no. so we're happening. We're they happening did that on to Med Mark before. They do it to everybody. So this is this is the yeah. date. So we're seeing. I, that's one thing I picked up. I was like the thirtieth. The thirtieth. I'm seeing this. And fifteenth, they'll go for it sometimes as well. But yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, they they're looking for those. They know when people spend their money. Yeah. You know. So they're and they. When the harmless people are most vulnerable and then attack. Yeah, it's bad. Exactly. So we do have a bit of a different setup today. Um, the bright, the light is really bright. They say that we look a little red, but I think it's just it's so hot. This light is right in our face. Um, yeah, it might. We're just kind of we're washed out a bit. It's not terrible. It doesn't really matter. You don't need to do anything with it. It'll probably just make it worse. Watch this. I want to say something. Close to it. I thought you were gonna make all the lights turn on magically. Well, ah, uh, whatever. I think we look handsome. Hey, Jer. I brought some really cool porn. You want to see it? Uh, yes, David has to come over here and show off his really cool porn uh, and tell us his dirty joke. So Johnny, Johnny won't be gone for long. He'll be back for 420. We got stories David must inform us of. Old stories. David Old has a thing. Now, since stories. I've known Mr. Malmo Levine, I've known about his porn collection that he loves oh so dear. And for some reason, it all started before 1975, I think, most of it. Maybe there's a like, few later than 75. Well, What's this Playboy? Be, yeah, this is March 1980, 80. which is also kind of when the uh, porn industry switched from film to videotape. Is, that's when I stopped watching. You like the older, the Boogie Nights style. You always remember your first Woody, right? So uh, <laughs> I, I discovered pornography in the 70s, and that's what I have the most fondest memories about. Um, but this Playboy, oh, actually, I bought it for the article. No joke, because the article 
actually corresponds <laughs> with today's theme, which is, it says on the cover, pot power, who will cash in if they legalize grass? No joke. Right there, 1980. Who will cash They're in talking when about they it. legalize? When they legalize grass, yeah. Well, if, 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 if they legalize. If they legalize uh, well, grass. Well, they didn't. But, uh, they if, didn't in Colorado. Yeah. The, uh, show them the illustration. Yeah, here, let's, we'll get the cam here. Uh, we have a, a beautiful illustration they provided the illustration cam. with George Washington. And you see it's just the normal George Washington on the $1 bill. Mm -hmm. But then if you flip the page... Ba -ba -ba. He's ah. taking a Coke. From it's like the reverse of a Mad Magazine fold-in. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. Well, and Mr. Washington was a hemp farmer, wasn't he? He actually did grow cannabis indica and tried to make it sensi. So I suggest that he was not only a hemp farmer... He was growing he was also weed. a pot farmer. He grew it in his vineyard next now, to his other drug crop, wine. I, I his, thought that uh, was a misquote. No, it's not a misquote. I actually wrote an article about it, right, and we published it. And it was this Lincoln is, that's the misquote. Lincoln is a misquote. He said he, he, or the quote was that he uh, smoked hemp and played his harmonica, and no one could find that in reality. Right. But the Washington quotes are real. And they're talking about the fact that he was tailoring his crop so that he would get female plants, He right? was very upset that he uh, was too late in separating the male and the female. So he didn't want it to go to seed. He wanted it sent to Mia. And uh, there's really only one reason. I, I can't think of another. The, uh, you want to get high? You want to get high? Okay. I'm, I'm good, uh, Jer. I'm uh, still a lightweight. Okay, here. Always. John. So, um, yeah, he, and, he, and he grew indica, cannabis from hemp seeds from India. He said that was more valuable than the common hemp. Why? I guess it was because it was a drug crop worth much more than the industrial. So crop. are they, like, budding these things out? I mean... We don't have any photos of George Washington on his hemp farm, sadly <laughs> enough. Big colas. Uh, but uh, one can Washington speculate Kush. why he would be growing indica sensimia <laughs> uh, for reasons other than the drug. I don't know. Uh, here is a quote from this Playboy article. And it is... I'll just read it because it's uh, very timely. It is very in the news today these days. Quote... Marijuana is the major competition to the liquor industry, and don't let anybody tell you any different. If marijuana were legalized, I think any businessman would be short-sighted not to consider making it available to his customers. Unquote. That's Lyle Jones talking. Jones is more than just the candid owner of Jake's Liquors in Davis, a University of California college town. He's a vice president of the 2,500 member California Retail Liquor Dealers Association and chairman of its Public Relations Committee. Ah. Jones is also concerned that marijuana may be siphoning off some of his gin, scotch, and bourbon drinkers, a concern he expressed when he wrote the lead item <coughs> in the August 1977 edition of the privately circulated CRLDA Bulletin. Quote, mm. All liquor retailers should realize that marijuana, cocaine, and other allegedly non-addictive and harmless drugs are direct competitors to the liquor industry. <laughs> One of the basic reasons for using alcohol in a social setting is for relaxation and camaraderie. Drugs purport to offer the same benefits. Yeah. So he's admitting his, his product is a relaxant and a social drug, and so are the illegal drugs, and he thinks that uh, they should get in on that. Which is kind of what's happening in Works. today's news right now. Right. We have uh, some uh, formerly of our community now working with the booze industry people who uh, are uh, pushing hard this idea that because marijuana is so dangerous, so, so incredibly harmful to young people, we need people who are really, really good at IDing other people. And who has the most uh, experience IDing people? Well, that's the liquor industry. So we'll just take this economy that has been uh, carefully preserved and protected for decades under the worst prohibition drug war conditions. We're going to take it from the people who kept it safe all these years, and we're going to hand it over to the people who've been, you know, contributing to a partnership for a drug-free America all these years as a liquor industry, and uh, who has never lifted a finger to help anyone well, legalize wait, cannabis. Now, wait, let's, let's not make a big jump here, because okay. where's the evidence? I'm not sure there's evidence that the local liquor distributors, meaning the stores that sell liquor bottles here in British Columbia, have anything to do with 
Partnership for Drug Free America. Yeah. No, that's the major liquor producers. Right. So beer and right. all. Now that's a little different. Spirits. Uh, like you know, been... if we were both sold in the same store, we would no longer be okay. competitors. With so them. the liquor industry as a whole has either contributed to the fight against us or hasn't lifted a finger to help us. That is a true fact. Well. I'm... Can you provide me an example of where the liquor industry said, "Oh yes, we'll step in and and protect our well, competition from really harm it's from about, the police"? Though. It's not about who did what in the past and whether we should reward this or that person. In a way, I, to me, it's more about making sure that everybody has access to marijuana and having a free market is going to be the the one that allows the prices to fall the most. And so, what the important part for me is the idea of the monopoly being gone. I don't care about who the, if they're the weed seller or like if they did, did this in the past with booze. Fuck all that shit. It's like, is it going to be available to everybody? And are, are you going to be able to get into the business? Are you going to be able to start a store? That's sure, what should but be important. I'll also be saying... In 2022, because there's a moratorium that, on new liquor stores. That I, th but I think smart consumers should reward the people who've been doing the work rather than the people who are opportunists and uh, should just get in at the last second when it suddenly becomes safe to do so. I think well, smart shoppers will do that always, because, yeah. because uh, then you have uh, a reward uh, and a set of an example for the future for other scapegoats who step up and stand up against tyranny and injustice that, that uh, after decades and decades of their work, they won't be stabbed in the back too. I think we should set a precedent for all harmless people to be rewarded for ending the war on themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, in the model that they're, what, what we're talking about, of course, is this partnership that the BCGEU, which is the union that runs all the government liquor stores or the, all their employees, and the private liquor stores got together, which is unheard of because they hate each other mm. and they usually work against each other. But they, in this case, they're like, we can see the dollar signs. Yes. So they so got together zeros. and, uh, and they want to take over or they want to be allowed to sell marijuana. Now that doesn't mean they'll take over anything. They won't, none of that will change anything to do with medical marijuana at all. Um, the, the problem that I see is if they don't allow either to lift the moratorium on the metal or on the marijuana side of it and still have the moratorium maybe for the liquor itself, um, that seems a little unfair. Why would we be all of a sudden lumped into this moratorium until 20, what is it, Johnny? 2022. 2022, that we're not allowed to open any new stores. Well, then you, can, you can apply at 2020. Right. But why would they put marijuana into that when, you what know, there, there's probably more demand for marijuana stores than there is for liquor stores. So we probably need more marijuana stores. Yeah, well, they want exclusivity and monopoly and cartelism, and there's you know, only one reason for that, greed. Uh, I also see a danger in associating hard drugs and soft drugs. Yeah. I think the Senate report from 2003 recommended cannabis uh, be allowed to be sold to 16-year-olds, uh, and I think that's a good thing to do because then you separate the hard and soft drug markets and you say that this is actually a little more dangerous than this one through our actions. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think uh, that hard and soft drugs should be sold on the same place. Uh, I think we need to separate the markets. But That's now, David, here, here, can you envision this, though, where you have this model where you know, the government stores and the private stores, and there's a lot of private liquor stores. I mean, there's shitloads of these things. Every block has... Happy 420. Happy 420. Like just in my in my neighborhood alone, David, on Denman Street, there are well, I can walk down my one area of block, and there's three major liquor stores in that one block. Mm -hmm. um, so if those were all pot stores or had half of it pot, you know, I'd be pretty happy. I don't think they should have any advantages over us. I don't think they should have uh, exclusivity in any way, shape, or form, and I don't think they should be allowed to say lies about cannabis without being challenged. Yes. I think if they're saying that cannabis is as dangerous as alcohol, they need to be called on it. Well, I think you're going to like my interview with Damien Kettlewell, Good. who is the representative of the, the union of liquor groups together. Um, he's are all the liquor stores, the private liquor stores. They have their little crew. He represents their side, and then the BCGU has their side as well. But, um, yeah, I kind of asked him some tough questions, and... I gave them a little bit of advice as well because they really, I think, were, they are trying to tie marijuana and, and alcohol into the same thing and say mm -hmm. that it's very dangerous. And that doesn't need to happen. No, it doesn't. Um, and it's because it's, nobody's going to buy that anyways. Pop people don't, they know that marijuana is not like alcohol and they don't really want, you know, a lot of pop people aren't going to be comfortable buying their weed at a liquor store.
It's true. It's like I said before. You don't buy your tomatoes at a gun store either. Yeah. Well, that's also true. Another interesting thing I brought for show and tell today is this book on marijuana by your favorite and my favorite author, Pamela McCall of oh, Smart yes. Approaches to Marijuana. She's definitely my favorite. She author. compiled this book. It was like the collection of the most recent Reefer Madness and Lies About Cannabis, all collected in <laughs> one handy edition. Uh, the foreword was written by David Frum, George W. Bush's speechwriter, and Kevin A. Sabet, PhD. PhD. Uh, P- piled higher and deeper. <coughs> and uh, what they do is instead of conflating cannabis with alcohol, they conflate it with tobacco. And they write, uh, well, you know... Uh, nobody's really died of uh, tobacco overdose, but that doesn't make tobacco safe. Mm. So I looked into it. Turns out, yeah, people have died from smoking too much tobacco. And nobody's ever Pretty died. Pretty rare, though. It's rare, but it happens. So that I don't think you should be able to lie about <coughs> taking one of the most toxic uh, plants that, uh, just to begin with, it's used as a pesticide. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, uh, it, it has the greatest number of deaths, cigarettes, associated with any drug. Uh, five million people die every year smoking cigarettes. What about, I thought alcohol... No, no. no. Uh, tobacco is like three or four times as deadly as... Yeah, that's in the United States. And then um, uh, I think it's 400,000. Yeah, pharmaceuticals kill are the biggest killer. Right? Uh, nope. No? 400,000 die of tobacco, uh, 100,000 die of uh, pharma, 10,000 die of aspirin. And wow. zero die of cannabis, ever. Yeah. And let's put a time frame around that <coughs> stat, ever. Um, so uh, the other thing is, is in the tobacco industry, there is a poisoning that farmers uh, typically get. It's called green tobacco toxicity or green tobacco syndrome. And what it is is you're, you're holding this resinous plants in your hands all the time. It goes through the skin and you start feeling really uh, sick. Uh, you have to go lay down. You, you feel like death. Anyway, that doesn't happen with the pot industry. So you're really comparing uh, the most, one of the most toxic uh, recreational botanical medicines and one of the least toxic <coughs> ones together. And, and we should really put cannabis in its proper category. The closest uh, example of uh, terms of risk and harm to self uh, is the coffee bean to cannabis. Mm-hmm. Uh, out of all the popular recreational drugs, cannabis is slightly less toxic uh, slightly less addictive than caffeine, um, slightly more impairing of novice users, but that's the only category that cannabis is more risky, more dangerous, more hazardous than caffeine. And because caffeine and cannabis have similar risks, they should be regulated similarly and taxed similarly. The, uh, the only exception, again, is novice users. Uh, I can understand why there should be an age limit. It'll help people understand that it does... <coughs> <laughs> tend to impair people who don't get the dose right or are not familiar with it. Mm-hmm. And then that'll allow parents to have still some control over their teens cannabis use up until 16. By the time they're 16, they should learn how to smoke pot. That's my feeling. <laughs> well, but it doesn't seem my whole thing about the 16 thing is, isn't your legal guardian responsible for you until you're 18? They are, but we don't have any age limit on caffeine, and that's a far more dangerous drug. Okay, with yeah, you're right. Greater, greater effects. As soon as you make well, the caffeine comparison, you do. You have deaths from caffeine. Uh, well, th- these diet David, pills that girls are taking. But euphoria is different in a way. It's on a different playing field than when you drink a whole bunch of coffee. Like, yeah, you can drink yourself a lot of coffee, and it changes your mood and your feelings. But it doesn't impair you in the same way that I would say marijuana does. And we have to be honest. There's a level of, I mean, you're not quite yourself when you smoke mar- marijuana, and that's what you that's, smoke it. Four. That's why I agree with the that's sixteen why it's year old age than coffee. Limit. That's why I agree with the sixteen year age still. limit. It's, that'll tell people it's more serious than coffee, mm-hmm. but less serious than alcohol, which I think, unless you're a dishonest scientist, you have to agree with. It's more serious than coffee in that one one category. It's less serious than alcohol in all categories. In Europe they don't they let the kids drink booze and they don't really seem to care much. Well that's you know, what I France. think we should eventually we should yeah. eventually get to the point where there is no age limit because ultimately age limits interfere with communication and interfering with communication is a more dangerous situation than the abuse of any drug. Yeah, yes, that's very true. So uh, you can pick up On Marijuana online uh, and read all the latest BS. I have one final thing to share with you before I head out 
and that is they dropped the charges on the security yes. forces of Cannabis Day. Me and Bert yeah. and Cameron all had our charges stayed by by the Crown, right? And so we don't have to go to court and defend <coughs> our right to resist arrest during <coughs> Cannabis Day. What I think this means is they're not going to ever try to bust anyone at any of our pot rallies ever again. Or else they're just going to get more resistance like we showed them before. We showed them what we're made of, and uh, we're ready for them now. So and, they're uh, backing down on that That means one. it's just Neil left. I guess. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen to Neil, but uh, hopefully he'll stand yeah. up and say something about uh, it being no big deal to deal to teens, if any, even if he was dealing to teens, but there's no evidence he was dealing to teens. No, so. I haven't seen it. <laughs> Unless, I mean, Neil's going to tell us when he comes and visits us in a few moments here uh, if there's actually any footage of him. I've seen the disclosure. Dealing... I've did seen you the... saw the video? I've seen the video. Oh, you did? I, I've seen the disclosure. Is there they any shared youngsters it with us around? Too. Was there there's, kids anywhere? There's, there's uh, 20-somethings with baseball caps. But I didn't see anyone who was shorter than an adult uh, buying from Neil, and I, I don't think they haven't. They would have uh, mentioned that definitely before they arrested him or during the arrest or an hour after the arrest. If you look at all the video footage from the news reports that day, they didn't mention minors either. Nobody mentioned minors until hours after the arrest yeah. when uh, it was mentioned in the newspapers yeah, as what? an afterthought Isn't because that... they realized that all the video footage has them being brutes about a harmless substance. And you notice they're saying that again in this latest round of dispensary raids in Nanaimo and stuff, or they had a bunch of ridiculous footage, or I mean, uh, comments yeah. in, the, in the newspaper that were like saying, we're, they, we found people selling to minors and a yeah. bunch of stuff. It was really They never ridiculous. provide any proof no. of any minor deals at all. This is why I wrote this book. It's about, it's because does cannabis inherently does. harm young people's developing minds? It's really about how scapegoaters use lies about the scapegoats harming young people as a way to whip up parental hysteria and public indignation and allow them to be brutal. And, and uh, it's all lies. There is no uptick in psychosis. There's no downtick in IQs since 1950 and today. It's in this, all, all in this chap chapter of this book. Uh, there's no evidence of actually any problems with cannabis that mirror the mass increase in use between 1950 and today. Uh, they, they, can't, they can look at isolated uh, cases with uh, groups of individuals that they experiment on, mm -hmm. uh, but they in inform that process with their own researcher bias, and it never pans out when they look at general population. There are no problems with the general population. It started in 1950 and increased to today at the same rate as the increase in cannabis use. So Dr. they're Grinspoon lying to you. Sorry? Dr. Grinspoon liked your book. I think most people who are on our side uh, and who have some uh, technical knowledge of the areas in, involving in these studies, uh, like Mitch Earlywine uh, read it and liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, everyone I've, I've shown it to has, uh, has liked it, except for Pam McCall. I don't think she's read it yet. Mm. But I gave her a copy when we were at uh, City Hall. The cover Hall. of yours is way better than the cover of hers. Yeah, mine actually has uh, some historical reference to it. It's... Uh, the cover I'm using is, is an old uh, um, movie poster for marijuana, Weed with Roots in Hell. Uh -huh. Racist and, much? Uh, yeah, there's a green, devil, dark-skinned man holding a young blonde yeah, girl who's smoking here. a joint. Yeah. And one of the things They're they, taking all our women. One of, one of the things they in, invoke at that time is it causes insanity, which is what they're saying today. It was actually Harry J. Anslinger who brought up the marijuana drives you crazy myth. And uh, they're still using... Uh, the same arguments, they're just using fancier terminology and uh, academics to make it instead of uh, policemen. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's the same old Reefer Madness. It's just Reefer Madness 2.0. And if you read my book, you understand how to make arguments against it and how to say, actually, no, cannabis doesn't make your kids stupid or crazy. There's no evidence of that in the general population. Stop lying about pot. Let us have our weed. No, your kids are stupid and crazy already. Yeah, your kids are stupid and crazy, <laughs> crazy but it's not because of the weed. Yeah. Maybe because of, of the entertainment that they're, uh, they're used to. Mm -hmm. But here, get that to, to the booze industry and make sure they read it. Okay, I will. All right, I'm out. Thank Later. you, David Malmo Levine. Oh, did you, did you tell us your dirty joke? Oh, here, I got a dirty joke for you. So this guy's uh, standing in uh, an elevator and a woman walks in. And she says to him, can I smell your balls? And he says, no. So then she says, oh, it must be your feet. 
Uh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> Johnny likes that one. Um, thank you, David. Way to go out on a high note there. Oh, yeah. Wait, it's 4.20. Oh, no, it's 4.30. Oh, but Neil's got to come and talk to us for a minute, too. Johnny's getting all excited over there. Uh, he's bringing his sign with him. I like that sign. It's a sign. For so, some uh, reason, the lighting on the show today is really messed up. Legalized, regulated, red. and restricted. Did you hear that? What's that? Legalized, regulated, and restricted. Yeah. You know, from the throne speech today. Yeah, I That's heard that. That's all they that. said. That's what it's... Yeah. So, in other words, legalized, regulated, and prohibited still. Well... Or monopolized, yeah. 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 Well, see, it's not him that's doing it. It's Jody. Well, it's... It's prohibition for the, the gardeners, and it's prohibition for the mom and pops and, and those kind of people. That's the prohibition. Uh, if he's going with that model. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm reading too much into that last word there, but restricted didn't sound very good to me. Well, I have a feeling no matter what happens now, if they legalize a bunch of marijuana and we have a whole bunch of businesses doing it, whether no, even if they're like the LPs, you watch what will happen. Soon enough... It'll be way better. We got a great big huge yeah. foot in it's the not door like we're gonna already stop. right now, and it and you know, that door's never closing now. That's what I yeah, you know I we've agree. been it's been worse always before us. We keep getting better and better and yeah. better, and so I there's a lot of alarmism that seems to be happening right now in in our movement, which is good. And not, and if good. they're gonna monopolize, it's good. It. And I'm and I'm not. Hey, I've been. Did you, I published an article yesterday that's very critical of Trudeau and the Liberals for not doing anything about what's happening with the dispensaries. And, uh, yeah, I think it's disgraceful that we're going <clears> to <throat> have more patients and caregivers and people arrested for something that doesn't hurt anybody. It's complete lunacy. It is. So, and uh, <clears throat> let's hope that doesn't happen. They're, they're not there yet, right? They haven't come up with their policy. They're saying maybe April they'll announce it, and they're going to have town hall meetings and a lot of discussion ahead of time. And that's why I think it's good that there's outrage. we got to go fuck these guys up. Because, you know, we need to mobilize. We still need people to be really active and vocal about what type of a model of, of legalization we need it's here. It's a very important, it is. like, stage that we have to pass through until we really get to what we want of legalization. Yeah, because it, this is extremely important. I mean, let's not get locked into some system that's going to be bad. Yeah. I mean, uh, we want to lead the world in this. I think we have a great opportunity to do that. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that we will. But there's still a lot of language, and there is obviously a lot of pressure on, uh, on Trudeau and the Liberals to monopolize things for the LPs. Oh, yeah, well, there's, <clears throat> there's that pressure. Um, but I think there's also Trudeau p trying to play it safe and make everybody happy. You know, he's still talking to the moms and dads yeah. by saying he doesn't want to look like he's going just crazy with I agree. Weed I think that's whatever, the, right? the, uh, he's the trying political to be noble. thinking behind that yeah, word restricted. Yeah, I think that's why he like, put that in there. He wants to be the middle guy. They're liberals. They're the middle. They're the middle. Yeah. So, but still, I mean, I think that no matter what happens at this stage, like, it, you know, we we're talking about if the liquor stores took over. So let's say, you know, worst case scenario, the liquor store, all the liquor stores have weed in them. Well, that's pretty fuck. I mean, come on. That's a hell of a lot better than what we have well, now. They can't be the only so, source. That's all. Because no, there's lots of people don't that don't want to go into a liquor store. There's a lot of people better. that are using cannabis because they're alcoholics. Right. Don't but, bring them into a liquor store to buy their cannabis. It, it's still better, though, than it is now. So, but. Yeah, don't send patients to liquor stores. Agreed. And, no, and, no, no, and no, a host of, of other people that don't want to go there for various reasons. No, medical should have absolutely nothing to do with recreational absolutely. at all. They, they should be, That's yeah. right. That's no. right. And recreational, if they're going to have it in liquor stores, they better have a lot of warnings because when you mix those two together, well, now you're really seriously impaired. Well, and yeah, that's an issue that I think is kind of strange. They're talking about, oh, it's the safest thing. We don't want any kids to get a hold of it. Where we're going to put a whole bunch of weed next to a whole bunch of bottles of booze. Yeah. Well, who cares if and the kid doesn't get it? And they're selling booze in grocery stores now. What about so I would me? imagine what weed would be else? sold in yeah. grocery stores too, right? Every time I go in there, that's I'm going to be like, well, that's I guess good. I'll have to grab a bottle too. It should be sold too. in every place that wants to sell it. Any retail outlet that wants to sell cannabis, it should be an easy thing to get into. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Let them sell it. Let everybody sell yeah, it. Yeah, let everybody let sell it. sell it. Let the little kid yep. with the, at the lemonade stand sell Stop it. Stop criminalizing right. anybody. Anybody that's caught selling it, don't criminalize that person. It's not a crime. Yes, and you know? increased penalties is what the liberals have been saying. They have been saying that. And that was on that. their platform before the election. You know, that yeah. was on their website. It said yeah, increased penalties for people that were doing Trafficking stuff outside, outside the of the system. system. But you know, Bullshit. in a way... 
I think what they might be trying to do with that is have a way of getting an organized crime who, you know, will not be part of the system. Or, and organized crime in a way, what he, what their meaning is gangs or people that we're sure, using. Sure, I mean, there's lots of gangs Those, that are selling weed and growing yeah. large amounts of weed. They might still want to do that. And if the price of weed doesn't come down, they will. Yeah. But the price of weed has to come way down. Like, way, way, way down. This is one of the easiest plants to grow. It produces more biomass than most other things. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, whatever tomatoes are a pound, that should be around what cannabis is a pound. Yeah, and lettuce, we should be able to... And then you the won't have gangs yourself. because well, they don't care. They're not interested in growing tomatoes. There's not enough margin in it. They have David to knows deal this. in things that are prohibited because there's a huge margin in that. Without the prohibition, there's no reason for a huge margin. You so know, it should come down. I didn't get a chance to ask Damien Kettlewell, who is the representative of the group of private liquor stores that get together as half of this partnership. Um, I interviewed him about it. I didn't get the chance to ask him about the grocery stores that are supposed to be selling liquor in the province of British Columbia. They got them to save on foods now. Got liquor and save on they foods. They do? Yeah. Oh, so they do have liquor and save on foods. Yeah. So does that mean that save on foods would be allowed to sell weed then? That's what I'm saying. Well, if save There's on five foods of them can in BC sell weed. Have, uh, the, I, they got their liquor. And the rest that of sounds them pretty good. Into, but five of them are done and operating you know, right now with a liquor aisle. That's not so bad. It's not so bad. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You can get a glass of wine at Urban Fair. Well, Shit, you can get your weed down Anybody can walk down store. that aisle. You're right. You can take your kids down that aisle, and kids can walk down that well, aisle. Well, and what I did ask him about was whether or not this uh, would affect bars or vapor lounges or anything like that. He said, no, this is only for retail sales. So you could open a, a bar, theoretically. Could have a, you could have a weed bar. Yeah. You could have an Amsterdam-style cafe. And and the promotion of alcohol. I mean, that's everywhere. You hear it on, in, during sporting matches, on the radio, <laughs> TV. Lots of advertising for alcohol. So, you know, yeah. I'm just saying, you know, let, let's have an equal playing field here <clears throat> where cannabis is treated as it should be. Alcohol is like the most dangerous drug out there, pretty much, yeah. uh, on, on the scales where they test for such things. Highly addictive, probably not as addictive as white sugar, but that's debatable. Mm -hmm. David so, says tobacco. Yeah, there's tobacco's a killer. Exactly. There's, yeah. There's, yeah. The link to David's article. I gave that book uh, last oh, week the, to uh, Linda Steele on CKNW, by the way. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. She had a program on there where she had a person from the Centers for Addiction on there talking all Good. sorts of crap about cannabis and especially harming young people. So I called her and critiqued that. I said, I take great offense that you think that myself, Justin Trudeau, and millions of other Canadians are now brain damaged because we used cannabis in our youth. And, <laughs> and it's, it's flawed. These studies are flawed. And I told her about the book, and then I brought her the book. So, mm -hmm. so she's got a copy of that now. We'll see what they do with it. Yeah. Yeah, they don't do much with these things. Usually. I don't know. Maybe they'll call David Shredder. and have him on. They yeah, they don't <laughs> read. Well, they I mean, just... Linda Steele's all right. I mean, you know, I think they do read. I think they will look at that. And, and I, I told them what it was ahead of time. I said it's an overview of the studies that have been done to show where they're flawed. And so, you know, they know what they're looking at ahead of time, and perhaps they will read it and give David a call. That would be great. Yeah. You guys could hang out. So Cannabis Day, eh? <laughs> I got pulled Day? over last night by one of the cops that was there on Cannabis Day, and he very sheepishly told me that he was there. And then we had a great oh. conversation. I th I'm sure he's even See, more embarrassed now that he's I got think, to know me. I think you're being followed by spooks. I think well, I ran a red light. Uh, well, <laughs> you keep breaking I, I had the a headache. Everywhere you go, I, there's I was, a reason. I was in the middle of having a really bad migraine. I never run red lights. You know, but I came to this light, and I just, I, I guess I thought it changed or something, but I went through, and all I could really think about was getting to the other side so I could pull over yeah. and take this pill that seems to work. And I pulled over, and then I got the lights behind me, and comes to the door, and he says, you just ran a red light right in front of me. And I said, really? I, I didn't know that. And he goes, and I smell marijuana. You're under arrest. Ah. Get out of the car, right? <laughs> You're like, I'm medical, so, yo. And I said, I, I, I'm a licensed uh, user of cannabis. And then we went through all that. And he, he searched my van really well. He pulled out several little bits of cannabis here and there. He had quite a handful of it. And uh, took it back to his car. And then his buddy came what back and said, in? your license is expired. And I said, yeah, I know. But I'm covered under the injunction. And they're like, what injunction? I was, I, saw, I had to tell him all about the injunction. Oh, wow. I said, check with your other VPD people. There's some of them there that'll know about it. And, uh, you know, I am licensed to have cannabis. And then all of a sudden, they just changed dramatically in their attitude. Uh, brought back my cannabis, put it on the passenger seat, apologized to me. Didn't give me a ticket for running a red light. And I should mention that when I was now under arrest out of the car, they said, do you have any weapons? And I went, yeah, as a matter of fact. And I, I reached for my back pocket to pull my knife out to give it to them. And they freaked and each one grabbed an arm. <laughs> and I said, hey, whoa, whoa, sorry, sorry. I guess, yeah, I, I was just going to give it to you. You know, I, I looked them both in the eye and said, I'd never heard either of you people, man. I'm harmless, yeah. man. I'm a yeah, good actually, human. yeah, here's my machine gun. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello to my little friend. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, 
So the, the, the one these cop, cops, so my man. partner, would don't, get, when he said, you Jeez, be careful them. with these guys. I know. You see how them is like blasting the shit out of that guy in San Francisco? Totally Holy wrong of shit. me to reach for my knife. Totally, totally wrong of me to do that. I should have just said, I do have yeah, a construction type knife in my back dead. pocket. Right? You got to stop tangling but with I'm these not cops. Good at that kind of stuff. I you got to stop hanging around with people with guns. Yeah, exactly that. Eh? That's the thing. So at one point, I was got all my get weed. He's got on the hood of my car. And he says, so you're charged with trafficking. And I'm like, what? Give me a break. There's not, what do you mean trafficking? And he says, no, you're, you're charged with trafficking uh, July 1st. And I said, oh, right. Yeah, but that's a bogus charge. I said, I, I'm not a dealer. Uh, I'm an activist. And, uh, you know. <laughs> so he says, was... no, my partner was there. And he said, you were dealing to children. Children. Yeah, yeah, right. And I said, I take great offense to that. When I heard that, They're when I got out of jail that night, I was so pissed liars. off at that. Yeah. I'm a father. I'm a community volunteer. I'm a hockey coach. I would never sell to a kid. Parents deserve the realm over their kids, and none of those people that yeah. I talked to that day were kids. And then I got to talk to his partner, who kind of said the same thing very sheepishly, and I said, you know, no, sir, wouldn't do it, didn't do it. I've seen the videos now. I sat with my lawyer yesterday yeah. and watched them, and uh, there's no kids there that came up and talked to me. I want to know where that came from about the kids. That was in the report, though, right? Not in my re in, in my disclosure, there's one of about 20 officers to put a report in mm -hmm. that said that he thought he saw me do a transaction with someone as young as 17. Yes. But that was the only mention of it in there. I'm not charged with trafficking and that's to minors. that's a minor because it's under 18. And, you know, and, and I said to the cop last night, what is, what is a minor anyway? I know the age of majority is 19, and that's when you get the most dangerous drug, alcohol. Yeah. But, you know, the Canadian Senate in 2002 said that 16 should be the age of access. And so, so what are we going to do? Are we going to leave the 15, 16, 17, 18-year-olds to the gangs and the creeps in the basement suites? That are, you know, do, do you want your 15-year-old daughter going to get her weed from some guy in a basement suite? Because, you know, she's going to do weed. it. If it's good weed. If she's made up her mind to do it, it doesn't matter that it's against the law. It doesn't matter that mom and dad say no. By 15, they're going to do it. So do you want to give those people to the gangs? Do you want to have your kids going in, in that place? Do you want to criminalize them? And, and he really understood and agreed. And, and he shook my hand twice before he left. He like reached, wanted to shake my hand. And it was an awesome encounter with the VPD last night, I must say. And no ticket or nothing, too. Yeah. He says, uh, in well, future, uh, Neil, don't reach for your knife. I said, no, no, I agree with that. But in future, I shouldn't red, r run red lights. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I'd stop doing both of those things. Yeah. Why do you carry a knife anyways? Well, because I'm a worker guy. Oh, it's like one of those kind of knives. I do. Uh, See, David. Right now, I'm well, in the middle a, of uh, building that's the like new a plot razor TV blade. Studio, studios. That's know? the knife you had. That's the knife I had. Yeah. Oh Lord, you should have said I have a razor blade, or I have like I a. I should have said I have a construction uh, have a, knife yeah. or something like that in yeah. my back pocket that I use for construction. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we're doing the Pot TV studios. We're a couple weeks away, maybe from having it look really sharp mm. in there. The doors yeah. are in. We got a window. They and thought door the chatters thought we were going to be uh, broadcasting <laughs> in the studio from there. today. But well, we could, maybe, but no, it's, nobody would be able no. to sit and see. You're putting a window, and we still have to knock part of the wall out and put the window Oh, yeah, in. it's not ready yet. No, it's not it's ready. It's not ready yet. And By next Friday. I'm far too high right now. I can't, I'm like, oh. I'm actually, this is the, you know what it is? It's because I haven't slept. Oh, I didn't, I didn't sleep at all last night. But look at, I, I honestly don't feel like I can talk properly right now. Like, <laughs> there's fine. something fucking seriously no wrong with know. me. No, 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 there is. Just no. you watch, just watch. No, you haven't made one single I'm slur like, or like, flub yet. I'm well. I'm a little slower than usual, i got to admit. The only thing you've done out of the ordinary is say that you're really high and you haven't slept <laughs> and you feel like you're flubbing things. Other than that, you're doing a fine job. Well, I, I feel great. There you go. I'm having a good time. I'm relaxed. I can barely keep my eyes, like... Have, have a puff of I'm not falling asleep, though, but I'm just, like... A puff of energy. Uh, so, uh, maybe I should okay, mention so, something else. It's been a pretty, pretty but, cool week. Wait, wait, wait. Show. Back to the what? studio, though. Okay, it's studio. exciting because we really are knocking out a wall. And so we'll have a window that goes from the vapor lounge looking into the new studio. Yeah. So it's going to be pretty cool. And it's yeah. right behind the dab bar. Yeah. So yeah. it's going to be cool. And tell them what's in the studio. We're going to have the big three screens. Big, three big screens. Uh, we're going to have the control room with all of the windows and stuff. Yeah. Uh, there'll be the desk. We'll put got the, the windows the in. in the wall that'll have all the lighting and stuff in it. And with yeah. the exposed brick, that looks really cool. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be awesome. It's, it's going to look gonna professionally done. Totally dope, man. And we're going to have the, um, the last piece, if we run, don't run out of money before we get there, <clears throat> is the signs for the walls. The glowing Pod TV sign and Cannabis Culture signs that will, like, make it look pretty nice in there. It'll finally yeah. look like kind of a, a real magazine office. Yeah. You know? It's going to be awesome. It's those little flourishes that 
kind of in the end stick in people's brains for some reason. It's optics, man. I'm sure uh, Crop King Seeds is going to want to have some of their graphics and their stuff in there as well. There'll be all kinds of cool stuff oh, that yeah, they'll yeah, put yeah. in there too. Oh, no, no. We'll have on our, our screens make it possible for us to really do whatever we want with this set because we have yeah. three giant 50 inch monitors behind. Well, it's not giant, but they're 50 inch monitors, big enough. And they're giant yeah. 50 inches. They're giant. They're, they're the biggest 50 inches. As far inch. as 50 inches go, they're yeah, giants. They're, yeah. Well, what's cool about them is they go right to the edge. So the screens, there's, all, there's like no rim around the screen. That's what I mean. There's, yeah. Yeah. They use up as much of that 50 inches as you can. Yeah, that's very true. So you want another story? There's the chatters. So, oh, somebody's being ignored. Uh-oh. Oh, I don't know what's going on in the chat. I've been ignoring the chat, but there is 72 viewers watching right now. Nice. That's not too bad. So I had a cool thing happen this week. What's that? Um, Freddie Fruitables uh, comes every oh, jam yes. night and brings edibles for everybody. He's been around for a long time. Such yeah. a cool guy. Um, he was in the hospital for a couple, three weeks there because he had a heart attack. And then they found he had a blood clot in his heart and they couldn't operate and oh. stuff. And he was there for two or three weeks. And, you know, I mean, he's, he's a chronic, right? So he was sneaking out and, and having a gagger here and there. And he did that the other day and got caught. So that led to an encounter with the hospital security, and that led to a, a little conversation with the hospital administration and staff, and they decided that he could smoke weed. And In the hospital? Yeah, and well, they said, probably not a good idea to smoke outside the hospital, so probably a good idea to smoke weed inside your room. So there we were, we rolled up a big fatty and we were smoking this joint in his room there in the hospital. That never happens, that never it, it happened. Was, it was where like do, surreal. Where do you smoke weed in a hospital? And they're like, oh yeah, don't worry about it. Lions Gate, put a towel North under Vancouver. the door. And did they, they didn't, and so somebody came what in. Happened. Somebody came in, yeah. yeah. So one of the nurses popped her head in halfway through and she said, hi guys, uh, could you maybe open a window? And we said, well, the windows are open. We'll see if we can open them some more. And she said, oh, thank you very much. Uh, we can smell it out in the hallway, but it's all good, she said. It's all good. <laughs> it's all She's good. She's like, we like the skunk. So, you know, we smoked her down, and then we chatted for a, quite a while did longer. They, did anybody from the hospital come in and, like, puff down with you? Nope. And that was the only person the we saw until 9 o'clock. The janitor comes in, he's like, I'm getting in on And this. it was kind of like 9 o'clock on the nose, <laughs> and that's when visiting hours are over. And in comes the head nurse. She's an older Asian woman. And uh, she's all smiles, and I said, uh, I was just leaving, and she says, oh, no, you don't have to leave if you don't want to, like if uh, you don't want to drive or something, right? Oh, <laughs> that's funny. So I said, no, I'm good. Uh, I'm a veteran user of cannabis. It doesn't impair me at all. And she says, really? Well, what are, what are the effects? Well, I said, it really ranges. There's so many different varieties of cannabis. It's kind of like wine, except that... With cannabis, it ranges from a relaxant to a stimulant and mm. everything in between. It's not like anything else. No, it really There's is. There's no and way to just... That's why marijuana goes, is so I mean, they, they hard for people to get. And they have relaxants and things that help people with pain and stuff. So I said, you know, anything from this side over would be called an indica, and that would be good for putting you to sleep at night and helping you relax and good for pain. And anything from this side over this way is a sativa, and that helps you get motivated. It gets your mind going. It gets you up and energetic <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. So then we talked about all kinds of stuff with this nurse, and I said, you know, humans are plant-based. And she looked at me, and I said, well, your, your body builds itself out of plants or animals that ate plants, other than the processed garbage food, but the real food that, that builds our bodies are plant cells. Really? And she agreed with that, and I said, so plants are what is medicine for us, and mm. that's where we find the herbs and the different combinations of these things right. that heal us. Okay, I can see that. And, and pharmaceutical companies, they're, they've gotten good at isolating other the components things. in plants that work, and then synthesizing them, and then charging us a whole bunch of money for them. Whereas really it's the plants that have those, those healing properties, and cannabis is one of the best. And then we talked about the nutritional value of cannabis and uh, stuff like that. And she was amazed and didn't know any of this stuff. And then, then she got a call that in the cardiac ward, someone was having chest pains and she had to go. And I said, well, okay, but have you heard about the endocannabinoid system? Oh, yeah. And she said, uh, no, she hadn't. I said, really, do you have a computer? And she said, she did. I said, Google I endocannabinoid so. system. And then she left to look after the person with the, the pains in his chest. And another nurse had been listening in on this in the hallway there. And I said, so that's your homework for tonight. You girls need to Google the endocannabinoid system. And about a half an hour later, I got a call from Fred. And the girls were asking how you spell it. And uh, they, were wa they were wanting to that's uh, Google funny. it. So, you that's know, awesome. Changing the world one hospital at a time. <laughs> They're all like, yeah, big crons now. And Can you imagine the conversations the next day if they looked it up and, and read that and went, wow. Because 
the I endocannabinoid they, system, for anybody that doesn't know, they probably did. Is, a, is a system within the human body that was discovered when the U.S. government tried to prove that cannabis didn't have medical value, and they found that cannabis actually binds to cells, and that that's because we have this system that creates this chemistry that are cannabinoids, or the, the mimics of cannabinoids that bind to the cells and do the same things that cannabis does. And that system was called then the endocannabinoid system, and it's the system that regulates and, and maintains homeostasis over all the other systems in the human body. So that's why there's you know, all these different things that cannabis is effective for medicinally mm -hmm. is because that's what it's doing, is supplementing yeah. the endocannabinoid system which looks after all these things it's in the human regulator. body. It's your regulator. It's your regulator of all it's, the other systems. It yeah. sends out anti. It's inflammatories like when you need it. It sends out pain relieving analgesics when you need them. Yeah. You know, it, it's that system that does all of that, and that's why cannabis. Our bodies are so that. much smarter than us. <laughs> you know that? Yeah, that's a very interesting comment. Isn't I agree. That, like, our bodies just know what to do, they do, it does everything. Imagine if you were in charge of that, of your own body, like you had to send out all the... Like if you had to Google everything you needed to know about yeah. how to breathe and no, get your well, heart yeah. going right and how to heal sores no, or and even if you just digest had to like, food. You know, you had to remember like, okay, in a couple seconds I got to send out another thing and like whatever for my send out whatever system. It's like, no, I'd probably be dead no, like a man. long time ago. Oh, so, man. No, there's no uh, way. Everything works on automatic. But we've developed above that a cerebral cortex with yeah. consciousness and an ability to, smart. to think beyond just our instincts. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're hungry, we need to breathe, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. And uh, that kind of separates us from the rest of the, the life on this planet. All highly sophisticated, you know, evolved <laughs> over four billion years, completely and utterly adapted to their own environments, all of these other life forms that surround us on this planet. Mm -hmm. But we are separated from them by our cerebral cortex, by our ability to to build things. No, I shouldn't say that because some of them build Neil, things. Neil, you sound like they think you're on cocaine in the chat, but I, I'm starting yeah. to think you're on acid or something. Now oh, it's getting man. all weird. It's like getting into a talk about the cerebral well, cortex. Well, that was good weed. I, could, I like, almost well, smoked that whole joint just, to my head. <laughs> we went way off how to then. We, this goes back to your court case. Not, not that I'm against any, uh, any people <laughs> doing whatever they want with other, other psychedelics say. and things that there are. Yeah, that's what um, happened. Somehow he got the Peruvian torch too close. You know, and I'd admit it if I was, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I'm just high on life and this amazing cannabis that I smoked almost to my head here. Uh, yeah, I'll smoke some more of that, but I'm pretty high. So, uh, Cannabis yeah. Day court case, um, quite a scrum. I got to watch oh, yeah, the video. The video. Yeah. But wait, I wanted, you have the file, but we can't play it because it's I not legal. I got warned legal. by my lawyer uh, advisor guy, not my lawyer, but the lawyer who wanted to see it and Rob. advised me, Rob, <laughs> that, uh, you know, it might be a problem if I showed it publicly on a program like this. Oh, so, that's a bummer. Not the problem I'm looking that's for. That's a right? bummer. Uh, That's okay. I though. think that they're going to probably drop it now. They dropped it on the other guys. Yeah. It's probably time to drop it on me too. Drop it like I, it's hot. I'm almost going to be very disappointed when they do that. Although I know it's a huge victory, and we then get to go <laughs> after them the civilly fight. for that amazing excessive force that they used and tried Just to kill me. Just be careful what you wish for, there, Neil. They haven't dropped it yet. I said, be careful what you wish for. They haven't dropped it yet. Well, but I'm almost saying uh, I, I'd be happy if they didn't. When yeah. I see that video, that, yeah. I would yeah, love to yeah. have a judge That's right. see that video. The judge watches the show. The judge needs to see that video Friday. for two good reasons. All of them do. One, because of the amount of force that was used against us for no reason. Peaceful people. I was warned by that uh -oh. VPD officer to stop doing what I was doing. And I told him I wouldn't stop because I was proud of what we were doing and it was the right thing to do. And that's a bad law. And, and as, a, as a, 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 consciously hum, a conscious human being, I feel obligated to break that bad law. And I told him that, and that's on the video, and that's one of the things that's so awesome. Yeah. But I didn't go back and do anything after that. I went, I went yeah. back and sat on the grass. And then and they, came, they in came in with a dozen officers. We counted them. A dozen yeah. officers I remember came in and kept, jumped on what me. What they did is actually they first started standing around you and like just standing there with their chests all puffed out. Mm -hmm. And I, I and saw... I was telling them to stand down. Like, what happened was that one of the guys was standing there. Yeah, and me and you walked up. And I on the tapes to too. I'm yeah. saying, you guys need We're to like, stand down this? and go doing? away. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're scaring people. You're going to incite a riot here. Us. Yeah. And then they almost did. They really did. So you oh, know, no, I'd be I would happy say, to see a judge I'd say see that, that was man. like, you know, one of the most brutal things that's happened in Vancouver in terms of violence on the streets since, well, since the I don't riots. recall seeing anything like that before. Police marching in and just, you know, so assaulting a, a non-violent person. I'm almost 60 years old and I'd never hurt nobody. I have a history of going to that, that place on that day for 17 years and never hurting anybody. And for them to do that, you would think that I had to be the most heinous criminal that had, had ever walked the earth. And they finally captured me, spotted me and captured me. I mean, that's the way they came in at us. Mm. 
Yes, so they looked they really, like... really bad. And I told them that, and that's on that video too. I told the Brandon Steele, the VPD officer, I said, if you do, that was the you, guy. I said, if you do Brandon what you're threatening Steele. to do, you're going to give us a video that's going to make you people look really, really bad. And then they went right ahead and did it. So I'm almost Brandon happy to Steele. go to court on it, Jeremiah. I mean, if, if it gets dropped and it should, then great, and we'll proceed from there. But well, if not, then I'm happy to go to court and defend myself and our rights and our community and all Canadians. And, uh, and, and I'm not going to stand for a judge scolding me again, like it like happened two times ago, oh, yeah. and telling me that, uh, you know, this is a serious matter, Mr. Magnuson. You know, this is a serious matter, and that's what I'll tell him next time. This is a ser- With all due respect, it's very serious that, that our governments, With no due respect. public servants, have violated our rights so drastically over this last, uh, you know, almost a century now, since 1923 <laughs> when they brought this law in. So. Yes. Well, I think Neil, my time is up. I think it is. <laughs> Ring the gong. Yeah. <laughs> Peace and freedom and, and push the Liberals to do the right thing every chance, every way you get. Join the, the Liberal Party. Take part in their forums. Go to these, uh, these public yeah, yeah. meetings that they're going to have. Will, that does Send help. emails. If we take the party over, then we're in charge of it. Right? So, Everybody should join the Liberal Party right now. Yeah, they're the governing party of Canada. You can join that and have a, have a voice in what what happens there. Yeah, it's and a good idea. And you can have a voice in this age I, of social I don't really, media. You can make. I'm a not difference. a big fan of the Liberals. I find them obnoxious in many ways. And I'm scared of them in lots of ways. Yeah, but I know? am a Liberal, and I am even elected to the Riding Association Board of Directors. They said they were going to legalize weed. Yeah, we joined the party. Yeah. you know, we had Jody try to run for him. We. Was, I you think know, we can still have an effect on what happens. We can still even write, help write policy stuff and get that pushed through to the general meetings and get yeah. it voted on. That's how this weed thing happened in the first and place. And Dana Larson and Sheila so. Jacobson and a bunch of others are working on a petition that's <laughs> going to be presented, an e-petition to, uh, to the Liberals. They've set up a thing to, to allow that to happen, and we want to word it properly. So that was being worked on today. So that's good. Really happy to see the, the, the dispensaries in Nanaimo that closed down, opened back up again. Yes, Kudos sorry. to you guys. Right on. Yep. That's the way we Rich do it. Rich Scott will be on that's the show the today talking about just that. Yeah. About how I think there was only one of them that's really closed. Yeah. So that's pretty and, awesome. And we need to or be writing free. letters and making calls and emails yeah. to the mayor of I Nanaimo, to the RCMP here. there, and, uh, and let our voices be heard. And yeah. Halifax, too, yeah. And, uh, you know, all over the place where they're doing this, this is... Uh, this is a serious crime now against what, what Canadian values uh, and what we stand for. It's time it stopped. They've got to stop wasting our tax money and harming harmless people. Amen, brother. Thanks for having me. Thanks always for voting, a, everybody. Always and, uh, a pleasure, Neil. Thank you for coming on. And it. thanks for the update about everything, studio included. I'm excited to get in there. You've done a fantastic job. It really looks excellent. I can't wait till that window's over there. Before That's Christmas, the next we'll step. We will. It'll be before Christmas because we're getting... I mean, shit, we're getting close, but it'll... It'll probably be a week or two. Yeah. So, okay, we better get, I mean, geez, it's already 5 o'clock. We took up a lot of time with those two guests, didn't we? Yeah, I know. See, but so, you, know, you know what? Here's what happens. With, this is it's, what happens when you it's get David Neil Malmo and Levine David at the same time. And Neil. They, each one needs a half an hour at least. Oh, we have a sign again. Ah, that's that's fine. Time. But, yeah, it's true. That was <laughs> it's, it's really. But you know what? It was a fascinating conversation with both of them, I thought. Well, we're really taking a look at what's happening in I Canada. Was, you didn't see me fall Canada. asleep, did you? Uh, well, you, you haven't slept. Um, <laughs> I have, I've slept a couple hours, so uh, I've been up all night myself, you know? Yes. Doing my stuff, but... Uh, but that's why you keep that hat on backwards. That's why I put the hat on backwards. You know, I was just looking at the Because as soon as you do, oh, you can only hear the Fresh Prince of Bel Air music in your head, there like... You dun, 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 yeah, dun, just dun, the hat, dun, dun, whatever. Dun, dun, dun. I can do this, but then you can't see my face, and then that's how I walk around now. Nah. <laughs> so, I'll what do you, you have on? What is on that? Well, phone? I'm just looking at the medical marijuana lounge farm assist search by Halifax Police. Yes. You know, this article was shared 1,100 and 1,100 times from the from that was uh, CBC. Yeah, from so Susan. I mean, we're getting lots of coverage with it out there, and a, and I guarantee Trudeau yeah. is seeing these articles. They're talking about it, and you know, there is there's no talk. I mean, reading articles, looking, and there isn't actually anything being addressed to the government about it. Why is no one? Why are we not hearing in in the papers about what's happening? Why isn't Trudeau doing anything about this? It's a good Except question. This, now they're thinking. It's a about very good question. It. It's a question that I'd like to know the answer to. And in fact, I sent a message to the Liberal Party, to the Justice Minister's office, and it was forwarded throughout their people um, in order to see if somebody would get back to me. But nobody's sent anything back to me, and um, I had a whole bunch of questions. So, yeah, um, they don't seem to really want to answer anything yet. Maybe they're waiting. I guess they have something up their sleeve. 
Well, there has been a little bit. Um, in I'm gonna, I'm just gonna share this around. I mean, we, here. we look, we look at a couple things. We look at legalization that we wanted. <clears throat> yeah, you had some interviews, simple. and I really wanted to listen to those. Oh yeah, we're gonna so, we so, play those. Like interviews. when we're talking about what's happening here in BC with it going to the liquor stores, and uh, I say as a patient, don't send a patient to a liquor store. But um, wait a second here. If you could walk in to how many liquor stores there are just in, if you lived in Surrey and lived on Scott Road, you would know how many there is there, one every block. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's how many are going to be open to the public for people going to purchase cannabis? Yeah, that's a good question. Just saying. Yeah, you're right. And just because they're there, yeah, who knows? I mean, there's a lot of that's up in the air about all of it. And that's kind of the thing about today's show. We were asking, who is it that's going to be allowed to sell marijuana? Exactly. And then we would talk about Shoppers Drug Mart. We'd be talking about pharmacies. We'd now we're hearing about liquor stores. The well, following have we been the about Shoppers Drug Mart? I have. <laughs> I didn't know you had. <laughs> I'm just looking at the turnkey of what Shoppers Drug Mart has. And, and one thing I've said in the past is, the Shoppers Drug Mart's got, got the whole setup. They, they, they house 200 doctors plus each Shoppers Drug Mart. Each Shoppers Drug Mart deals with 2,500 patients plus. <laughs> I mean, so since I mean, you mentioned that, I looked, did a little research on that. Yeah, <coughs> there seems to be <coughs> some. <coughs> wow, that's good. What is that? Um, that there actually, in particular, was pressed out Jamaican mm. dry sift. Wow. So of course the Jamaican. Mm. And then you squeeze it out. And that's grown with 315 watts in LEDs. Mm. That big bag. So Can you I did some research. Bag? Oh yeah, I, yeah. Well, I, um, you, I know you're tired. He's been I'm, up doing research all night, guys, because he really wanted to talk more about what's going on. So get <laughs> back I, yeah, on back have, on track here. Get these uh, interviews that you've done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're and uh, Jer's tired. I am tired. He is. He hasn't slept. I haven't. And we can I'm see good. that. And so. I, I was just going to try and share this around in the chat. Actually, this article. Yeah. This was about. Bye, Ann. <clears throat> what's going on? Bye, Ann. See you later. Um, this is about what's going on here, but it's not. Uh, I don't have a pot TV window up. <laughs> I don't have a pot TV window up. <laughs> Where'd my chat go? Jerry's lost the chat and he's tired. There it is. Yeah, and he's close I just high. plugged in my data stick, so I'm going to get the video up. Now, the first interview I have, actually, I have three different interviews. One with Dana Larson, and I talked to Dana about his new book, um, which is the Cannabis History, the Illustrated History Yeah, I just of saw that picture on uh, Facebook. We have a copy of the book here, several of them in the lounge. We obviously have some downstairs in the store for sale. Um, but we're going <coughs> to... <coughs> Pardon me. Dana's going to talk about how he made that book and that kind of stuff. Um, Nice. Also, I talked a little bit about Damien Kettlewell. He's uh, the representative for this whole new liquor thing. Yeah, I want to hear that. I think we should play that first. No, well, we're going to play that one last because the first one I want to play is Rich Scott. Okay. And what's happening in Nanaimo and what's happening in the dispensaries across Canada with the raids, the continued police activity, and Justin Trudeau and the Liberals really not doing anything or helping out at all in any way. Um, not offering any support. And I, I have this article. This is the one I was going to share around. I point out in this article that Justin Trudeau actually supported the dispensaries. Or he, dis- he supported... No, he said he supported The one patients. in Winnipeg. No, he came out for, in support of the one in Winnipeg and said it should be... Look, I can show you. I linked yeah, to, I I linked to it twice in my article, one. two different, arti- two different um, mainstream news articles that say Trudeau supports illegal pot shop. And it was the one in Winnipeg that got closed. Um, uh, Glenn Price. It just seems, Glenn it seems, Price. It seems we're all. It was really nice to see that we're going to be getting uh, Had him on our the show. access. But I think uh, that was before he was elected. As Chili Boo in the chat said, yes, um, that was when JT was on the road. That's right. Trying he, to get elected. He was, he was trying to get elected. Yeah. He supported these. Yeah, and so, but you know, it's a weird thing though because really, there's been more bus, way more since Justin Trudeau has been the Prime Minister of these dispensaries than even under Harper. It's 100%. That's what we're trying to get across here. A lot. What's going on. There was nothing rated under Harper. We had a few here and there. Um, Little ones, even when Randy was rated or we had uh, Brittany and stuff like that. So we've had friends we know clubs that have been, but they haven't came in and done swoops like what they did in Nanaimo, Mm -hmm. um, what what they're often trying to do in Vernon. And I haven't heard anything back from Vernon today. I made some calls last night and had some conversations with some of the people that started up some of the clubs there. And uh, one guy, he said, he goes, he just walked away. He says he's got family now. And he just, it's it's just, it's, it's hard because of the pressure that's happening and they see what's going on. 
with the system. They're like, oh, well, he's all supportive access. And, he's, and he was like, you know what? If I can, if I can go and get it from, from, and I would say shop at Drug Mart and get some like full melt tangy or something like that. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm for it. Yeah. Well, and that's consistency. If I get that all across Canada as a patient, yeah, that's consistency that I look for as in for a, no, a recreational. If it's some really good shit, guys, hundred percent. Yeah, but I'm a medical patient, so that's what I always look at, and I got to look at consistency for pain <coughs> and stuff like that. So, um, hmm. I don't want to walk into a liquor store to get my pain meds for sure, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to be looking at more suppositories and oral forms of THC that's going to happen in the legalization platform for patients, and that will give access and hopefully coverage that's a big one if we can get coverage for patients for these suppositories or any kind of oil form when you're in the hospital with cancer or going for surgeries i mean these are things that we got to really look at so i mean we'll see what happens in the future here but i mean i I see that kind of future maybe happening for patients and i think it'd be better access uh well for myself i mean and everybody else that's dealing with with severity of different injuries when you're you're suffering you're in the hospital i mean you can't smoke and what happens if you can't get out of bed Mm-hmm. And they do, and they can come in here and give you something that's going to be cannabis related. The one that's, on, the one that I have on the data stick is the Damien Kettlewell one. I did put the, go. that one on first. Where are you going? I could go and switch it. It would just take a second. Chatters get to decide which one do you want where to watch this, where first. Where the chatter stand? Like, the the Damien Kettlewell one is um, a little bit longer. It's the longest of the three. And uh, yeah, it's pretty good yeah, here. Well, Spencer's for many users too, exactly. I mean, we should it's, bring. It's, we just, should, it's just not. We'll, go, we'll start with this one since David went off on this already. We'll talk about this one first. So, um, get the little window yeah, the up RCMP here. Yeah, the RCMP are our federal government. That's the problem. Yeah, they. It's a bru- brutal thing when these cops are just running rogue all over the place. And nobody can control him. The mayor of Nanaimo says he can't do anything about it. That bullshit. Um, yeah, I know. That's a little weird, isn't it? I don't believe that. Yeah. The mayors run the police and, and, and their jurisdiction, don't they? Well, he said... Not he necessarily, the, I guess. In these, he told the press he doesn't. He said because they commission it out, they forfeit that or something like that. But that I thought they actually had some control with some sort of a board over what the police do municipally anyway. But well, they spend the wrong. funds for the police. And, yeah, who knows? Um, okay, let's see. <laughs> Here we go. I'm just giving you guys a little window here. You want to hear this one? Okay. Um, It's a little loud in here, so you you might need the. uh... Turn it up. Hey, we got. We're listening to this. You want me to jack it up? Okay. I'm giving them the little window here too, just so they can see the awesome graphic. (laughs) Gonna make sure you get the BC liquor store in there. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so this is ready to roll. Um, so this is my interview with Damien, and yeah, it's, I don't know, I, I, at, first, Mike at first I was against, then Dana gave me some quotes, and I was really convinced that this yeah, might be a good idea, because it would really be all over the place and stuff. Well, that's and, what I said. I but mean, then after my talk with Damien, I was just, nah, Go. Uh, not listen. so sure anymore. I want to hear some stuff you guys here. So I think, do you have saying. Dana's, we should listen to them both, and then we can talk about no, it. No, Dana's is in the article. Okay. Um, but act- oh no, Dana. Sorry, right. Dana. I do have an um, interview with him about this subject. Yes, I do have Dana's as well. But we're doing Damien's first, so we'll do Damien then Dana. Um, I just got to flick the switch on the mixer. Where's the damn mixer? Here it is. <laughs> I really am high or tired. Okay. And if this sounds bad, let me know in the chat. Here we go. Jeremiah here with Damien Kettlewell, who's the non-medical marijuana spokesperson for the BC Private Liquor Store Association, a group which has made a partnership with the BC Government and Service Employees Union to ask for permission um, from the government to sell marijuana at liquor stores when we have legal marijuana sales allowed. Damien, good to have you on the show. So, Damien, why are liquor stores the place to sell marijuana? Well, uh, that's, that's a great question, uh, and we believe that the sale of non-medical marijuana should uh, occur in the most socially responsible way possible, in an age-controlled environment uh, with the strongest track record of uh, checking identification. Right, so we're talking about minors here. That's something, obviously, that's very important at all of the liquor stores. You know, you get carded and everything. Um mm-hmm. But I mean, I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't take a lot to check an ID. Why is it that that's something that's complicated? Well, yeah, it's a. Uh, you know, it's a, it, a lot of it comes down to the fact that uh, you know we bring to the table a 
a multi generational multi generations of experience in selling illegal controlled substance, which is uh, alcohol, and uh, we believe that experience will be critical uh, to the rollout of non medical marijuana sales in, in BC. Um, so a lot has to a lot depends on what happens on the federal scale and with the provincial, federal, and uh, territorial task force, and a lot depends on. Um, if, it, if the responsibility is um, assigned to the provinces, uh, but we are not—we uh, haven't led the way on this as far as uh, speaking out. Um, the Premier of Manitoba has indicated that he uh, thinks that uh, the sale of uh, recreational marijuana should occur through uh, liquor stores, and as well, the head of the Ontario uh, Public Service Union, a government union, has said as well that uh, he believes the sale of uh, adult use metal marijuana should occur at, at uh, liquor stores, and uh, so we're um, you know we're the third region to speak out, uh, the third liquor sector region to speak out in this capacity. And so now, what would this mean for, say, the dis- the um, producers of marijuana? I mean, where would you guys get the pot from? You know, uh, that is a uh, that's just a great question, and it is a complex uh, production environment at this stage with. You know what the, the 26 odd uh, federal uh, growers under the MMPR program, and then the growers under the MMAR program, MMAR program that are still growing. But you know the alliance is uh, focused on. You know, we we believe in having producers of all sizes, many of them local, uh, creating jobs in their communities and selling to a central wholesaler at the LDB, and then distributing via the LDB to public and private stores. So um, you know production is a complex, complex uh, regulatory and um, production environment is not easy to produce quality uh, product, and so we don't pretend to be experts in that. And we are focused primarily on retail, and we will buy from producers that are approved by the provincial or federal government, whoever that may be. Right. So that could mean any multitude of different things, including the larger LPs or the smaller mom and pop kind of things. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, we don't we don't really know where it's going to go, but we believe that. You know, the production should occur. You know, the wine and uh, and the beer, craft beer and craft wine sector section have uh, sectors have been uh, quite healthy in in BC. And ironically, there's about 270 uh, vineyards in British Columbia, and those vineyards, um, uh, about 70 percent of, of those are small vineyards, and they don't have the critical mass to get access to the LDB. And so, what happens is that. Um, they sell directly to the uh, private liquor store channel. There's 671 private liquor stores in the province. And so um, if they're quite clear, the small and medium-sized vineyards, uh, that uh, they really um, uh, they really value the private retailing uh, of, of liquor. They, they really value that distribution means because they can deal directly with owners, they can deal with smaller businesses, and it really propels a lot of the revenue growth and allows them to survive. If it wasn't for the private liquor stores in D.C., um, uh, this, even the small vineyards have been quite clear. They don't think that they would be as uh, they wouldn't be fiscally sustainable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I saw your quotes about supporting home growing. Yeah, that that is a um, you know that is a uh, that's happening in wine and beer in the wine and beer sector, of course. And uh, you know, we believe that in, in keeping in the lessons learned in Colorado and Washington, that uh, it's important to have an allowance for small scale, non commercial, personal production of a few plants. So. Um, you know those matters are making their way through the courts now, and uh, but we're uh, we think that we're fortunate because the jurisdictions uh, to the south of us have, uh, have moved ahead more aggressively on uh, recreational marijuana, and uh, they've uh, mostly uh, rolled out very successful programs. There've been a few hiccups, which is uh, bound to happen when you're dealing with a new controlled substance. Uh, but in general, we there's a lot of things we can learn from, from them down there. Now, you mentioned how many locations, so how, how many would theoretically be selling marijuana right away? Or well, right away, I mean, that, that's, that would be, um, you know, there's, a, there's a, almost 200 government liquor stores, and so that would be a question for, uh, for Stephanie Smith and the uh, liquor distribution branch that run the almost 200 government stores. Um, but as far as private stores are concerned, uh, you know, that would be, We'll see what happens as far as the regula- regulation, the design. I mean, when we design a new liquor store or we are, say, renovate a liquor store, all of our plans have to be approved by the Liquor Control and Licensing Board, and we have to meet strict regulatory guidelines uh, to ensure that the product is sold in a safe and responsible way. And so we would anticipate that there would uh, be design uh, programs in place. You have to meet certain standards to, to be able to sell.
sell uh, non-medical marijuana. Um, I'm not sure what those would be at this point, but I imagine we have to meet those standards. And so, uh, number one, there's two things. I don't think all 100% of all the private liquor store retailers would want to sell marijuana. I, I can't speculate as to how many how would. I imagine a good number would. And then number two, you have to be able to meet the provincial or federal standards, whatever they might be, to ensure it's retailed in a responsible way. Now, would this give liquor stores in the province a monopoly over non-medical marijuana? Um, I, I don't, I don't think so at this point. I, I, um, you know, I don't think it's a monopoly when there's not hundred retailers. Um, so um, that doesn't be my description or def- definition of a monopoly. But uh, mm-hmm. well, um, but what I mean time by time will tell. I mean, time will tell where where things go. What I mean by monopoly would be that because right now there is a moratorium on creating new liquor stores, um, it would just be the liquor stores that are already there that would be allowed to participate. Well, you know, we we would have to see. I mean, the government uh, puts in place supply management licenses in the fish industry, in the dairy industry, in the milk industry, in the taxi industry, in the liquor industry. So we're simply one of these government-generated licenses. And uh, these private liquor stores have been around since the early 80s. Uh, they started off with beer and wine, and then we kind of morphed it to be able to sell liquor. And so it's it's been an evolutionary pro, uh, uh, process. And it's important to point out as well, Jeremiah, that this is a unique retailing model across Canada where we have a combination of uh, seven, almost 700 stores and almost 200 government stores. That's uh, it's, it's different. Alberta is all private. Um, and then you go across the country, it's all a little different. Ontario is, is mostly, uh, there's beer stores that just sell beer, as I'm sure you're aware. And then there's government stores and liquor stores. So it is, it is, it is different. And, you know, the, the comments that we receive from the public are, I think it's been interesting on, on a call yesterday with, um, with CFAX and, 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 uh, and Vancouver Island, there, there seems to be a, a preference for long-term can- medical cannabis users to do some, some of them are concerned about cannabis selling next to alcohol because they're primarily cannabis users. So I think that's something that, we, that needs to definitely be taken into consideration. But when you look at uh, when the legality, the legality is in place, there's going to be a lot of new consumers that come on board. So I, I would encourage people you know, in the cannabis industry on the producer side to consider that because people are comfortable shopping in liquor stores for the most part. And so as long as it's designed in a responsible way, I think we need to be aware of those new consumers that are going to come on board. A lot of people who have shied away from it but might want to uh, try it since it's, it's a legal substance. So those are the sort of things that... Um, you know, it's simple, that we'll have to consider, the province and the government will have to consider. See, what for me, I would totally be willing to support a system where everybody is allowed to take part in it, um, you know, and that would be a free market system. Uh, what, I'm, what I would worry about is a system where, you know, the liquor, liquor producers know about liquor and they're very good at, you know, um, distributing liquor and doing that kind of thing. Marijuana is very different in the product and the product knowledge that goes along with that. It's very specific and it can take years. Um, And in fact, people have dedicated their whole lives to this subject, just like people who make alcohol have and who are in that industry as well. So it seems odd that, you know, in, in my worry would be that we would be handing this over to the alcohol people and not allowing for those other people to take part in it um, for however long that moratorium is there, or if they're, you know, the monopoly question I think is going to be the big one for the community because why should we trust the liquor stores to know about products with marijuana products? Yeah, I mean, there, there's going to be, we have a very intensive product training program in our sector. There is, um, you might be aware, you're aware there's, a, there's a, you need to get a certification, a provincial certification called serving it right to be able to sell liquor and everyone who works in a liquor store has to get that. We are on the watch for intoxication. We can't sell to intoxicated persons or, and uh, we're on the watch for, you know, retailing it in the most socially responsible way possible. So there, as far as, uh, as far as, uh, you know, selling marijuana, I agree it's a different product, a different, has different, you know, psychoactive, uh, it's psychoactive more so than, than liquor and uh, they would have to be product specific training on, on means to sell it responsibly. But I'm confident. I mean, we've got some great bureaucrats, great civil servants in Victoria, and we've got a great, uh, great knowledge base in British Columbia. And I really believe we can craft a, a great uh, retail and, and you know, a great, so we can great, we can create a great sort of retailing certification system in place for those folks that work in, in uh, these parts of the store and not selling non-medical marijuana. So, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm optimistic and hopeful that, uh, that the provincial government, uh, I mean, this has always been a significant industry in BC, and um, I'm hope that we can uh, utilize a lot of that uh, intellectual capital that's already in place and, and use that to design, you know, a best practice system. If we look at right now, I mean, the premier just had 15 people, uh, experts asking, uh, preparing their her climate, uh, her climate team sort of uh, solutions to help BC meet its uh, greenhouse gas emission goals, and, and they just put out a significant report. So uh, I'm not sure what the, the federal government, provincial government is going to do, but I imagine that they're. They're going to uh, assemble a group of experts, and they're going to listen to. They've already indicated on their task force they want public health officials, they want addiction specialists, and they want um, safety experts. So impaired driving and MAD, and, and all they want all these forces and all these stakeholders to come together and, and make their recommendations. And so it's going to be it's going to be it'll be interesting to see how long this takes. It could be it could be you know take a while. It could take a long while. Um, you know, we've stated with our alliance that we're hoping to retail non-medical marijuana in Christmas of 2016. So that's, we put that out there. That's our goal. And we'll see what happens today with the throne speech. And we'll see what happens with the task force. And, you know, there's there's a long, there's a, there's a lot of things that have to unfold over the next, over the next while for, um, for the, for marijuana to uh, be sold, uh, non-medical marijuana to be sold. So it, it's mm-hmm. going to be a process. Now about, you know, if, would there be the possibility of having a system like right now, as it stands, the mor- the moratorium on liquor stores deals with m- liquor, and it's about r- limiting how much liquor there is. And of course, there's going to be a different amount of liquor than probably marijuana. There, they might be more demand for one than the other. Um, so, is is it possible? Would it that moratorium automatically apply to the cannabis side as well as the liquor side? I don't know. I, I don't have the answer to that. I can say in regards to uh, to my liquor stores, the beer and wine stores evolved for liquor primaries, uh, and liquor primary is basically a pub, which is just basically a restaurant now. But if you had a liquor primary license in the early 80s, you could apply for a liquor retail store. So that's how the liquor retail model evolved in British Columbia. And, um, you know, I, I don't really know how it's going to, we don't, we don't, we are we're we are, uh, we're we're business and we're the we're, we're the business sector and the BCGU represents sixty eight thousand union workers across the province. So, you know, we're we're saying that we're um, we're enthusiastic about you know retailing non medical marijuana in the most socially responsible way possible. And and I, I I'm I'm very hopeful that you know those folks who have uh, be all that knowledge in BC that is in place in regards to cannabis, uh, you know, continues uh, to participate in the sector. But, uh, you know, on the bright side, I mean, our non-medical, our medical marijuana system, the federal licensing system is, is regarded as one of the two best systems in the world. So we have an excellent, um, you know, in regards to quality control, in regards to uh, and, and good manufacturing practices, the Israelis and the Canadians supposedly have the two best um, federally mandated uh, federally mandated uh, production systems are both for medical marijuana. So, you know, there is that basis there. And, um, you know, I would certainly hope that we would be we would be behind some more than 26 and, uh, producers. And I think that, right. that's going to be, it's going to happen. And, uh, I, you know, um, even, you know, in one cre- in the interview yesterday, um, one of the, uh, Pamela from um, DFAX has said, you know, there's this, this uh, product has been, you know, it's, it's helped communities grow and it's been a huge uh, income and job generator in, in rural communities and I think that uh, I think the Premier will be cognizant of that and I think she'll uh, design uh, a responsible um, non-medical marijuana retailing uh, system. Mm-hmm. And you guys don't want to affect anything to do with bars or things like vapor lounges. This is just retail sales. This is just retail, yeah. Great. Well, Damien, I mean, this is definitely an exciting thing. What The thing that looks good to me about it is the momentum that we would have. I mean, with you guys already have, you know, there's you guys are established, you have the locations. Um, and, and I know that there's some dry counties, things like that, that don't have liquor. And you, I think you, you were quoted as saying that there'd be the possibility that some counties wouldn't have uh, marijuana either. But that, you know, it's very few usually that would, would opt out. Um, and so the momentum that you guys have would probably help the pot community a lot, you know? I, I really I really think so, and I would encourage, you know, those long-term folks working in the sector for a long time to be open to, uh, to uh, you know, the sale of cannabis in liquor stores. Um, 
and really consider the, the new consumers coming to the marketplace, not that you're, you're not the uh, your traditional, um, you know, historical consumers. There's going to be a lot of new consumers coming in, and, and to really retail that and to make those folks feel comfortable, I think it would be best for the sector uh, to to sell it in an environment that they're comfortable with. And, you know, I, I think the industry is really going to have to weigh in on how it can be merchandised in a store properly. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's just, I mean, the cannabis product industry has evolved so much in the last five to ten years in regards to all these different edibles and oils, and and it's it's really a diverse product offering. So, yeah. um, and it's not related uh, yeah. to liquor at all, really. In fact, for, that's the other question I wanted to ask you was: Isn't there a downside to selling uh, what's a relatively harmless plant with virtually? I mean, the, the harms that come from marijuana are, are very very small when you compare them to liquor. Liquor is considered by scientists to be more dangerous or more harmful to you than heroin and crack and things like that. So, Well, you know, I, I think there's definitely, it's a controlled substance, and if it's not consumed responsibly, uh, then uh, it is it's very damaging. Uh, it can be it can have a lot of uh, addiction, can, can cause a lot of problems. But if you look at, I mean, you're well aware that the level of THC that's grown in this new product, I believe it's called Shatter, I mean, if that's that's consumed in the wrong way, that can that can be harmful as well. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, in Colorado, with the edibles, some of them have been consumed by children. The packaging hasn't been appropriate. So, yeah. you know, but, but if you consume I, I, things I agree together, with you on the dangers of alcohol, and but, but also in regards to cannabis, I think you know it, it has been proven that it, it does delay brain growth to those folks up to twenty five. It's harmful uh, to your brain, and, and uh, similarly to alcohol is. I mean it. It's, you know, the doctors say don't yeah. have more than two ounces of alcohol a day. And, you know, there hasn't been enough research in cannabis because it's been illegal for so long. We don't really know what the safe amount is. But there, I, I'm, you, have you seen those stats that it's, uh, they recommend you don't use cannabis until, you know, I've uh, seen them. until around 25? Actually, the is still melting? there's a great study that um, an activist named David Malmo Levine, who's a great activist and researcher, has um, done and for Cannabis Culture magazine. And actually, it's been published now as a book. And what David did is he looked at all of the studies available, um, all of the ones he could possibly find, and he got the help of psychology um, professors and others to help him find all of those studies. And he – I don't want to get too deep into it. You should read the study. But it was the study of the studies. And what David found is that most of those studies, with the exception of maybe two of them, did not hold up to scientific criteria to actually be able to hold any water. Um, When you put these studies – to the real test, they they rarely ever have any sort of in the end. By the time you're done through with all of it, anything you can really use um, to to actually show anything to do with the development of young people's minds. Um, it's yeah. pretty. It, it's there's a lot of propaganda, and in fact, a lot of the people who are doing these studies. I mean, this is a big issue, and it's actually a really large piece that David wrote. That's why it was published as a book eventually. Um, nice. But yeah, I mean, it, that's something to look at. And I think there's a lot of, of course, with marijuana, there's a lot of stigmas. There's a lot of hysteria. And there's a lot of special yeah. interest groups who have um, reasons for wanting marijuana to remain in this status it is in now. So, you know, there's been yeah. a history of a lot of that stuff, too. But, I mean, that's yeah. another, that's a whole other issue. I think... No, I mean, I, 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 I fully believe in the, in the, in the patient-doctor relationship as far as treating specific medical conditions. I, I, I definitely, science has proven that. And, uh, but you know, we the the THC level has grown exponentially in, in product over the last fifteen years. So it's just good to be cognizant because we don't want people to have a negative first time experience with cannabis. When you have these new consumers coming to the marketplace, we don't want we don't want negative experience. We want to be positive experience. We want them to consume the proper dosage amount, and uh, and that's going to be part of the education process and make yeah. sure that it's a it's a safe and pleasurable experience. So um, so the rollout is a positive experience for consumers. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, yeah. well, when it comes to that whole side of things, I think, you know, I, I do, I really with you that I think we need to uh, make, you know, the environment safe for everybody to be able to use these things. But when you look at the history of cannabis and you look at how it's been used up till now, it's been the wild west of cannabis, essentially. There's not a lot of people checking into hospitals for cannabis and there hasn't really been a heck of a lot of problems with people using cannabis on any level at any time. Especially, you know, when you relative to any other kind of drug or a substance like alcohol. But um, you know, what for me, what it really comes down to is we want to make this available for everybody as much as possible that wants it, that's going to use it safely. And if the liquor store, I mean, why should we, why should we stop the liquor stores from selling it? 
um, they should be able to sell it just like everybody else should. It's just the whole monopoly building thing that I have the problem with. Yeah, yeah I think, well, you know, I think public addiction and public health um, specialists and professionals, they seem to suggest that it's good to have a good amount of tax on these products so to make things uh, to support our healthcare system and our education system and the access to, to liquor at least they suggest that it shouldn't be retailed everywhere so I think that there should be limits on, on, on retailing and distribution so there will be uh, there will be it'll be interesting to see what the experts say I don't claim to be an addiction or a public health uh, expert um, but I, I look forward to learning from those people on the safest way to uh, to retail non-medical marijuana and one issue we have Jeremiah is, is impaired driving I mean we've the province uh, has made great strides. Uh, it made some excellent public policy on uh, lowering the alcohol blood content level to 0 0.05, and that is one of the challenges we have with marijuana. We don't have it effective. It's been illegal for so long. We there hasn't been proper testing done to determine, well, um, you know, how we can determine if someone is impaired with their driving. I mean, our alliance is definitely, uh, you know, key, keenly focused on that, and we want to work with Matt and ensure that there are there are these tests in place because, uh, you know, I'm a father and. Uh, you know, uh, and I just want to see it uh, consumed safely. So, yeah. See, Damien, I, I really feel that one of the one of the things about lumping marijuana in with alcohol is I really don't want to start considering them as the same substance. And right, I can right. hear I can hear in your talking points and some of the things where the places you're going here, you know, the angle that you guys are taking. You're really trying to make marijuana and alcohol sound like a similar thing in a lot of ways. But what I really think you you might have more success with especially okay. with our community, is if you if you pay attention to the major differences between marijuana and liquor, and that includes, right. you know, the, the whole driving issue is one, and we, we definitely need a way to, um, you know, with all people, anytime anybody's impaired on any substance, and that includes pharma Absolutely. pharmaceuticals, Absolutely. Yeah. but that's, they have impairment testing for that. So I'm not convinced that we need some sort of a chemical, you know, like, I, I actually think that's unscientific, the nanogram limits in Washington and things like that. When, when scientists look at these things, they do admit that it's not very scientific. Um, mm -hmm. But so, you know, I mean, alcohol is one thing. It's a little bit more of a consistent blood alcohol ratio deal. But, you know, and yes. you can, but so and but it's different people, different people have different sizes. I've always been an advocate of impairment testing, not necessarily drug mm -hmm. testing. But, yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, and you know, when it comes to marijuana, I really think um, in our community, the pot people, we don't want to be treated like liquor people because we know pot's yeah. not the same as liquor. You know, when we're talking yeah. about the dangers yeah. and stuff, like uh, to kids, fetal alcohol syndrome and the damage that yeah. liquor does, oh, yeah. it's not yeah. quite it's not quite the same as marijuana. And you know, in mm -hmm. places like Amsterdam, um, they do separate marijuana from liquor in a very specific way um, so that they don't associate those two things in that same way and so but I hope I, I like where you guys are going with this I just Thank hope you. that we yeah. don't get into that whole idea of saying that marijuana is the same as alcohol because it's definitely not right no I think, I think that's a good point and um, you know where the our industry is definitely open to learning all about the uh, a safe way to do it and uh, and, and uh, you know respecting uh, those uh, those consumers in that community that's worked a long time in the sector, uh, yeah, but I, you know, I, I'm hopeful that the uh, that the producers uh, in the supply chain in the cannabis sector realize that there's going to be the the, the, the market's going to triple or quadruple when it's legal, and there'll be there should be great job opportunities for all those folks who want to operate in a safe, secure, and uh, responsible sector. So that's that's where uh, that's where we hope to be going uh, together. Well, fast changing, exciting times right now. Damien, thanks so much for coming on. I'll definitely be checking in with you as much as possible about this issue as we move forward. Thank you very much for having me on, Jeremiah. Awesome. So, We're back. You know what? It sounds like um, some, some back, backs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what'd you, what'd you think, chatters? I saw what you thought. Yeah, we saw what the chatters <laughs> were thinking. Um, Definitely I have paying to, attention to that. Yeah, I'm not so sure about all that. Um, <clears throat> it sounds like they just want to hijack it. Well, they want to. They want some. They want control of it. Um, they figure this is going to be the fastest plan of g gaining access for on the recreational. These guys park. don't know anything about weed, though. That guy knows nothing about weed. But this is the whole thing. Are they going to hire people in the industry already? At, uh, the, the government looks at they can hire. Uh, uh, I was just mentioning this. So, I went to the local liquor store the other day, get a bottle of wine, mm. and. 
That's I realized so they had good. all new training yeah. staff in there because I mean the one store where we have it's a signature store. It's the big one out in, the, in my area, mm-hmm. and they were actually training new people. And I was seeing something that I hadn't seen before. I haven't been in there a while, and I saw all these changes that was going on. So. It's kind of interesting. Maybe they're already acting on it. To go take a look at your government liquor store, see if you see any changes, new staff working in there. Mm-hmm. It'll be interesting to see if this is actually already a said done. If they're matching it in the media, it might be already a done deal. You know, that's a funny thing you say that because... It's kind of what happens. and They're going to say, I, well, blah, blah, I have here. a contact yes. somewhere, and I, just, I guess I Don't can't whatever. say Please. too much. But I got the indication from my talks with this person that there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. Yeah, and so drug mart. It's weird you say that it's already said and done, but <clears throat> now I'm going to have to do a little bit more digging. But I don't know. It, it seems like to me that there's definitely been a lot of talk. Oh, it's huge talk because they've already promised legalization and they got to come up with this fast now and access and they're going to use licensed producers. Where is this talk happening? Wow. Like, where is the talk happening? Well, behind closed doors, right? Yeah. And it's, and it, and it is, and it's, and it's, and it's not government. I believe it's corporate. Yeah. I don't like it. I don't think that this is how a democracy is supposed to run, is it? Well, here's Who's the making whole all these thing. shady deals? That's not under any corporations, scrutiny. Corporations though, is what runs the worlds now. I mean, come on. Yeah, but. So. That's some serious, sneaky ass shit, though. But. That's when, 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 when you don't do they have to set up like keys. an official commission shit. I don't know. To me, it seems like you can't just all of a sudden be what are they? The f- I wouldn't be surprised if, CIA if, the, if, if, if workman's compensation was going to be growing weed. But you know what? That's the whole thing. We, you, you're looking at bigger entities and, well, and then you're looking at stuff happening. You know all what's over funny the about world. the BCGEU? And I have no, I don't know why I wouldn't say this stuff. Yeah. I, I was a member of the BCGEU and I used to work in Surrey when it was so okay. So I had no job for a couple weeks. And, <laughs> so I worked at a liquor store. And I, so I got a, my brother in law to get me a job at this, the worst place ever. It was the most terrible call center Scott that Road. anybody could have ever worked at. Yeah, it's right over on this side of the bridge. Yeah, it's <laughs> RMH NCO. It's like a massive barn massive. of a warehouse. Yeah. And all they do is they shove a bunch of phones in there and they throw a bunch of people in there and they have you. <laughs> they have you answering calls and doing customer service and doing like Google words and all that kind of stuff. But like I was, the, the mission that I was on was Amazon and Target.com. So yeah. Amazon.com and Target.com, customer service. And so people would call in with like, where's my book or whatever. Yeah, and you're and like, well, here, like, let me check it. I'll get the name. And it's exactly. still en route. That kind of shit. But when I was there, it was so slave-like and like sweatshop-like that it was like actual really bad, brutal conditions in there. There was like noxious gases leaking into the building. And so that was probably the, bunch the of people, people got nosebleeds. And we ended up having to call, we actually had to call like. Yeah, uh, they, did they have to tear that place down? Did they? Yeah, I think it's gone now. It was right on the other side of the SkyTrain bridge. Yeah, I remember those big call centers being you there. Go over the SkyTrain bridge yeah, and right know, below I, it. I used to live in Surrey. <clears throat> yeah. It's a great place to grow weed. The pH What's water the was six. What's the SkyTrain stop? Never mind. <laughs> it's not important. But anyways, yeah. the whole point of the story is that the BCGEU unionized the place while I was there. And it was an interesting thing that happened when they unionized right. the place. There was some sneakiness. Well, what do you think that is? Um, that's because unions, that's what they do. Was, unions fight I, like corporations fight. I, I was in a union. Yeah. Unions are, they're like the corporation, they're like the anti-corporation, though. They all yeah. have the, like, left-wing mentality. They all yeah, have yeah. the very, like, Shop progressive sort of and, thing and, going on. And. Yeah, I know. It's like it, the same as the students' union at university when I was at my university, so anyways. What union do you belong to? Union, I don't, I'm not part of any union now. So what we're looking at right now is we're looking at unions coming in to sell marijuana. So it's going to be, they're looking at job creation. They're looking at, I mean, can someone actually apply for these jobs that have a better skill? All the people that have worked in all the marijuana industries that know the strains and what's happening? Or is it just going to be like, oh, you're getting Tilray number B? <laughs> yeah. Are they going to be vending B. machines inside of liquor stores? Who knows? Like, are they uh, going to be... Are, I mean, there's I so know. many things we don't know, but we do know Some one thing. Some things I like the idea We're gonna get of. Some access. things I don't. It's going to happen sooner um, than later. We got to show off some okay, fine. crazy buds. 
So Crazy here, here you guys go. So Jared's showing off. So this, if, if, if you guys pay attention, everybody does. Um, this was the Jamaican louse bread that uh, I got from uh, Bubble Man. And uh, this was grown under the ceramic metal highlight, 315 watts for 65 days. And then because as the sun goes down, it gets lighter. I put this under the, the CFMs, the compact fluorescence, for three more weeks. And then I let it hang dry for 30 days. When I opened up that bag, what did you say? Me? What yeah. word did I yeah. use? Yeah, what was your words? I don't know. I was like, that's fucking delicious. So um, definitely... I think, I think I said, mmm. That's what I flavor? actually said. Mm. Yeah, that's what I said. Mm. You can't really say anything else. So some say smoke the sweet so skunk we got over mm. here. Yeah, I got some sweet I love skunk. It. Um, so it's it's definitely like a. It's really shaggy. It's a seed from 1995, from what and I understand. So. Sativa, like the leaves are all good. Like this whole thing. This is the dry sift. Oh man, this Check thing is this, this is. I crush it over screens to get that. Of course, that's what I do. And it's so terpy, it is insane. Like looks, when you smell it's a this. Big bud too. Oh yeah, of course it's a big bud. Yeah. And there's a whole bag full of them. So light up that joint. Lambs. This is Bob Marley's favorite strain, wasn't it? That's what that's what it was classified as, and, and you're gonna find out why. You can hear Bob playing right now in the background as we light this joint. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hey, I haven't even smoked this yet, like, so I'm like, that's going to be actually. salad, man. Sorry, dude. So this is my first <laughs> light of this joint, actually, and uh, it's like four months in, in the making. So Carly I'm Marley kinda, says, I want it in my lungs. We're going to pass it to you, my friend. Oh, Carly, I wish you were here. Yeah. Yeah, so you know what? Um, Miss you, sweetheart. What we're seeing with the legalization, we saw the Ontario government retract the first day. They said, smoking anywhere. The next day, they're like, yeah, well, maybe not. Maybe not. What's going on with the Maritimes? Yeah, that's the best place. Mm. It smells good. I can, the smoke smells good. But the bag is just insane. How much did you weigh the, this up? No idea. Like, I can't imagine it's so airy and light that this probably weighs like a gram. <laughs> I might have rolled it too tight. Okay, I'm going to dry sift token. Okay, so really, what are the next steps? What's Canada doing? What are we expecting? Oh, we have fellow RMH workers sending me messages. Who? That's funny. So, of course, parchment. Mm -hmm. A little bit of uh, dry sip. Squishing it. So, I kind of forgot what we were talking about. I did a couple <laughs> quick joints. We did a couple toasts of this joint. I, we got someone right here, right beside us. He's like, let me try that. Yeah, Pete 2.0 is in the Pete house over here. All right, Pete. and what I need to do right now is um, pull this thing out of here and queue up okay. this next. I'll grab him something. I'll be back in two seconds. So I guess we have some more coverage of Dana Larson talking about the liquor store model and then his thoughts, and he's in full support of it. That's what we're understanding, hey, Jeff? Yeah. Well, well you know what? I mean, you I'm, know, the thing is, Dana didn't hear that interview. So, is he in chat? <laughs> I think that Dana's been maybe fooled or wooed a bit by some of the in-text quotes that sound a lot better in text form than they do when you actually got the guy in front of you and you can grill him a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if, if I uh, grilled this, this him is enough. The, this is the cell phone lighter tech? Now that I think about it, when I was listening to it and stuff, I was like, man, I wish I would have said some other stuff. We were commenting on how everything's a tech, so I had to laugh. Everything's got to be a tech. Phone lighter tech. Cell phone lighter tech. Cell phone lighter tech. Nice. Hilarious. When you can take fresh gland heads and press them out and make them do that. 
We're trying to get um, this interview up for you guys. Yeah. I don't know what is people saying in the chat. Do you do a great job? Great interview. Oh, yeah. They liked well, it. With that guy. Jerry, you ripped him apart. Good job, dude. Nah. It wasn't even me trying to be rude or mean tiny. or anything. I was just asking basic questions that, tiny. you know. I think that partially that these guys think that they really want to link pot and alcohol together, and they're trying to make pot sound like it's bad. And I just, I don't have any tolerance for that anymore. It's like, come on, how long have people been smoking pot? Like I said to him, it's been the wild, wild west of marijuana consumption out there for so long where people are over consuming everywhere. We don't need some fucking regulatory body to come in here and tell us how much we can smoke or how powerful our weed is gonna be and all this kind of shit that this guy's talking about. That's not gonna happen. No, it doesn't. Nobody's gonna take it seriously. Wait, wait till we start These taking. Guys just, they don't understand it, so wait. they can come in and say it, and then as soon as they, as soon as it fails, they'll be like, oh, oh. Okay, so here's the thing. So let's just say, so they're gonna regulate cannabis in these stores, so which is cannabinoids. What about terpenes? Mm. Because that's not a cannabinoid, and like we can separate that now. There's a whole Can't. new industry of terpene modulation and stuff like that, dealing with cannabinoid oh, therapy. Oh God. <laughs> so you know what I mean there's, there's so much we're scratching the surface it's really I don't think anybody really knows how much or how fast or, or where we're going with this plant and, 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 and they're going to do one thing and we're going to come out in another way we're going to find another yeah. way of how we are able to get what we all fight for all over the world we fight more for this plant than we do for world peace really it's, it's interesting in how we really fight because it saves it's people's lives. Piece. It's a regulatory system, and we know that. Neil, was going on about the ECS? We all know it. I mean, it's, it's just a plant. Yeah. And as they slowly recognize that it is just a plant, but now they're trying to monopolize on it, and what I always say, the 100-year lie. Talking about 100 years. They made cannabis illegal 100 years ago. Look where we are in 2012, 2012. People have been smoking weed right? forever. Look at how things have changed. It was a 100-year of prohibition against cannabis. How much money did they make out of the opioid system in the last hundred years? Now they're gonna make it off the endocannabinoid system. They've known about it the whole time. The research they shows through 1961, the, the United Nations, through all of that, 71, you take a look at it all. I'm gonna go on my rant, sorry. Speaking of the United Nations, <laughs> there could be big changes coming in yes. a lot of different realms. That's what we're looking at. When you take a look at a world realm of what's happening all around the world. Yeah, cannabis is going around the world. It's the green way. It's happening. But and it's going to be a whole new change. A whole new. The, the world needs a change. The stuff that's happening right now here in Canada with the liberals reminds me a little bit of what happened when Obama first got elected. You know, when Obama first got elected, he cracked down harder on the medical marijuana dispensaries yes, than he Bush did. did. Then Bush did. That happened. And then they legalized. No, he did. No, numbers did. were there. We, we, the numbers were there in the yeah. beginning. We did. I remember strictly talking about you no, he, with this. Uh, well, whether or not he did it, under him, his his peoples, his his boys. Yeah, so, so not those saying, are his boys. Just it's, like it's, the RCMP, that's Justin's boys. It's, it's, they're Justin's boys. It's still under Justin Trudeau. I just think that he hasn't picked up the phone. JT. That could be, oh, Pete, here, you take this. It JT could be. hasn't picked up the phone to say, yeah. hey, don't prosecute, don't hassle. Don't, we are obviously heading this direction. So this is the Wild West playing out. These are independent ideas. Yeah, there were a few regions. news articles that brought that up, that these RCMP officers do have jurisdiction over their areas. But, I mean, he is, Justin's in charge of the RCMP, though, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. He hasn't said, don't do He's that. He's a busy guy. We're getting guys <coughs> playing business as usual. And you know what? Some of the people that I, I talked to have said that to me, that they think he's probably just busy. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but to me, that's kind of like a cop-out. He's just busy? Well, yeah. He's he just, just, he just got yeah, he's, He didn't make it his mandate. Well, he did put someone in charge is right it? away. He has said, here, you're like in charge how? of structuring this. Come on, we're talking we're, about we're people... Here. We're talking about 16 arrests in three dispensaries. Like, you think the guy could pick up wait, the wait, phone. Wait, wait, wait. That's just Nanaimo. What about Saskatchewan? What just happened in Halifax? How many people they arrested? there? I'm looking at one, two, three, two. I don't know how many in Halifax. I was just reading yeah. looking for that. There's been at least 16 the, people or just in, 18 people just across Canada. Just in Nanaimo. Canada. Yeah. There's 16 in Nanaimo. And we yes. can keep going. We can add up numbers, actually. Um, but 
Yeah. But like you're saying, oh. we're going to see this happen, and then they're already putting in the change. Yeah, coming oh. up, and What's boom. That? And then all of a sudden, it's uh, finally Global we can relax. TV? And, and Which you one? Know what? We're going to put on our last little fight. And it's, and it's just oh, like when today. Harper said that, you know, cannabis was worse I'll than tobacco. <laughs> Indefinitely worse. The throne speech. Infinitely, sorry. So the throne speech was today. And in the throne speech, it was mentioned that marijuana will be legalized. But what was it? What was the language? It was it'll be legalized, decriminalized, and no, it was I can't remember what the it'd be regal, was. illegalized. It, the word uh, restricted, restricted was there, but what was the other word? Oh, regulated, legalized, regulated, and, and restricted. restricted. Yeah, That's legalized, regulated, and restricted. I can't believe I remember that. So restricted really for restrict. Well, they want to restrict. Anybody who's outside of the system that they set up, and anybody who's slaying in on the side, they say they'll have increased penalties for those people. So you tell me how that's a real decriminalization of marijuana. They're going to increase the penalties for marijuana? They're going to increase that's the penalties for say. people growing illegally? It says, it says word for word, 100%. increased penalties In so, so on their website, the liberals. So basically, if you're going to be growing illegally and not in the system, it's going to be coming against the growers. And I really believe that. They're going against the growers and the dealers. And, and, and they're going against these clubs. They're going against the mom pops of the industry that have been around since... Well, they have to time. allow home growing. If they don't allow home they can't growing, take away we're going to riot. To well, you know what? We'll riot. Huh? We'll riot if they don't allow home growing. People around the world will riot. Well, people around the world. People all over the world. They won't be able to get in my garage, man. Um, <laughs> I don't think that uh, I, mean, like, I don't think that off. they're going to be that stupid. I hope they're not. Well, we're, we're, but we're seeing stupid right now. We yeah. never thought it would happen. Well, but we're seeing stupid from cops. We don't know. We haven't seen any stupid yet from the liberal government, other than to them, other bleh, other than them saying that it's illegal, which is accurate. So they they haven't had the chance to change it yet. They said also that they're going to bring in legislation to legalize marijuana. So that could take a while. It's not like legislation moves very quickly. Go Why don't bills? they use it's regulations? Three bills to be a regulatory system. They should just regulate it like the conservatives did, but backwards. <laughs> backwards. You think leap is too large? No, I don't think that. Law enforcement happen. against prohibition. No, I don't. I don't think that it's too much of a leap to deschedule it. That's not a. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right away, they're not letting people out of jail for, for marijuana tight crime. As a I know. I, I, I rolled a nice tight because it's dry, but Whew. I mean, it's tasty. You got to work for that. You got to work for that. You're really, when you're high after that, you really feel like you're accomplished, too. Because you had to put in a lot. He's <laughs> like, Hey, you know, it's actually the first Jamaican that I, I've smoked, so it was kind of kind of nice. Mm. I brought it down here in the bag. I was like, say that again. I brought it down here. <laughs> no, that last part. <laughs> oh down. yeah, nice. I like that. Crushing over some screens. I'm doing it's a little video beatboxing. On it, of he's got the hat backwards, and all of a sudden he's beatboxing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what happens, you know. He's gonna start busting out some raps next. We start having cipher. hash days. I figure you have to have a hash day. Hash hat hash backwards. All right, so here we have another video well, to play for y'all. Now, this yeah. is the Dana Larson so this video. This is how this is Dana's look. Dana, Dana is like, you know what? It's just sell weed. Oh, here, I got to do this. Sell thing. as much weed as we can <laughs> anywhere right now. And I agree. I mean, come on. Open it up. Grow it. Sell it. Smoke out. Grow out. Mark it with a T. And smoke and smoke out, overgrow the government. I actually have that sign still at home. One of the original skateboards. Skateboards. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is... Oop. <laughs> I don't skate. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't have... With the hat backwards. I got some long words, too. Yeah, not mine, but... They're definitely all painted That's up just because you're klepto and you just keep stealing no, them from actually, kids? No, actually, anything to do with cannabis and, and in the industry that have been through archives. I got stuff like from Jody from back in the day, some of the first things. Just oh. little things because I have my own Stole little Stole some of her shit, too, I got huh? my first grow. 
my first medical grow. I got my first seeds from Health Canada. You know what? To me, it's, it's a bit of my history of how cannabis has changed my life. And, and I can look back on it, and every time I do, I smile. You guys should take up on that. What, what's your cannabis stash? That sounds like what's a song, Johnny. It's a, it's a song. That sounds like a song. That shit. Here we go. Yeah, that's right. Here, Here we, we go. go. It's yeah. getting sentimental, though, for a rap song. You got to throw in some, like, swear words. I got robbed and my chick got stashed. <laughs> Hey, that's pretty Fucking good. Fucking motherfucking cops came and took my hash. <laughs> oh, that's not bad. Shit, you hey, are freestyling already. I got this, I got this hidden little thing. It's that hat side. backwards. All of a sudden, he turns into like a rap uh-huh. star. <laughs> puff, puff, pass. <laughs> what rhyme just... So, all right. Can only have fun, right, guys? That's what it's all about. It's not giving me the window here. Next video's coming out oh, on this Jamaican this that we're me. smoking right now, actually. On the dry sift, and that, and actually made bubble hash. Took an ounce, 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 and saw the different ratios, and in the midst of testing it this weekend, and take a look at the different accuracies. I'm curious. Just wondering. I'm so busy, it's insane. At home with myself. <laughs> At home with myself. I gotta know. It's just everybody's asking. I've been asking for a long time, and now I can take a look and see what we're looking at. Like even the leftovers. And, and, and the rosin chips, 13% THC was left in the we rosin We should start chips selling fresh. rosin chips and just so salt like them. Lightly chips. salt them. Barbecue flavor, that, salt I haven't, vinegar. I haven't, I haven't done them under the rosin heavy squish chips. like uh, there's a... Uh, Cheddar flavor. He's, he's, got, he's got a vice. I want to test bad. his chips and see what Not the squish bad. is and the, and the pressure and what's being left behind. Like even running the bubble hash and, and, and the BHO material. I tested BHO material. Jeremiah here with Dana Larson. No, 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 no. Dana, longtime marijuana Sorry, activist. Everybody on this show knows. Sorry, Good to have you on again, Dana. Always a pleasure, Jer. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I got to listen to that for a second because of this damn thing. Mm-mm-mm. Can we hear this? Can turn it up. We hear Dana. It's not going yet. Oh, it's not going yet. No, you were still talking. It wasn't I don't know. Supposed I thought you cut that off. I just like, oh, you're going in there. I, I forgot. No, this thing is really actually. This is a really me. nice high. The the window will not Excuse size me? to the right the, size. The three in a circle. Where is it? It's like what about all it? Up in the top of the head, eh? Oh yeah, that's a nice high. Look at the hats on. I'm rapping. It's all on the top of the hat. Um. Oh Lord, oh my. It's gonna be one of these videos I'm gonna see in like 20 years and go look at John. <laughs> like, fuck. Pod TV's got it all archived. <laughs> oh, yeah. Google's definitely got me archived. That's okay. We're spreading the word about the great plant. You know what? It's cannabis. And, 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 it, and, it's, and it's the most wonderful thing that you can ever... It's the most wonderful thing you will ever experience and when you're in need of something that's going to give you pleasure, increased dopamine, better general well-being. I don't know. Puff and pass. We're waiting on Jared. So... Half of this yeah. video, <laughs> half of this video is about Dana's new book, mm-hmm. and the other half is about the possible liquor store dispensary model. Oh my poor Dana kitty! My poor but Dana, kitty. I remind you that Dana had not heard what da- what Damien said to me. He didn't get that whole detailed interview. He had just read Damien's comments in the newspaper and some other things that were a little. Oh, I don't want to. I'm not saying. I don't think they were misleading at all in any it just they were carefully chosen and they didn't tell us all the all of the details so but Dana Larson Dana Larson activist extraordinaire but here before I do this Bong rip do one up we got to make watch sure watch the show that the sound is proper and it is enjoy okay. I'm doing a dab with some uh... Jeremiah here with Dana Larson Dana, longtime marijuana activist. Everybody on this show knows. Good to have you on again, Dana. Always a pleasure, Jer. So, Dana, a couple things I wanted to talk to you about today. One very exciting thing, first on the list, is your new book that has just come out and arrived on the shelves. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. It's called Cannabis in Canada, the Illustrated History. And Really, I've been working on this book on and off for like 20 years now. Some of the art in here was drawn in the 1995, and some of it was drawn just a few months ago. But it's about 140 pages of beautifully illustrated uh, uh, story of cannabis in Canada. And we start off in 1606 with the very first crop that was planted here, and it goes all the way through right up to modern times and the election of 
Trudeau. And I learned a ton of stuff writing this book, and I guarantee that no matter what you think you know about cannabis in Canada, you're going to learn a lot when you read it. No kidding. Now, this is not just like a small little book either. I mean, this is a quite a piece. How many pages is it, Dana? Uh, the whole thing's uh, about 160, but there's a few pages of ads, and there's pages of references in that. So the content's about 140 pages. Uh, and as we printed it oversized to show off the art, so it's, it's like 13 by 9 and a half, uh, which makes it kind of stand out a bit. And uh, and really, I, I was able to find all kinds of fascinating information about hemp cultivation in Canada by the French and the English colonists in the 17th and 16th, 1700s, and medical marijuana and recreational cannabis use in Canada uh, during the 1800s. Uh, some fascinating references from doctors and patients talking about using cannabis for all kinds of ailments. It. You could buy pre-rolled joints in Canada for about 80 years from the mid-1800s until Prohibition came about in the 1930s. Uh, much like it is now, you go to a pharmacist and buy pre-rolled joints just like you go to a dispensary and you buy them now. So uh, people were doing this uh, over 100 years ago. And uh, there's all kinds of wonderful stories in here that I think people will enjoy. Yeah, you know, that's the one of the things, Dana, when I was reading it that I really loved was that it's not just, you know, a recent history of marijuana activism, of what we've been up to in the last while and all these kinds of stuff. This is a really a lot of treasures that you've unearthed that, I, you know, I had absolutely no idea. Um, and, it, and some really just bizarre things that I, you know, aren't really part of the sort of known stuff in our society today that I think a lot of people would be really surprised by. So that's... Uh, it's well, a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, as Canadians, most of us get the American information. So a lot of us know George Washington grew hemp. Mm -hmm. and we know about Harry Anslinger, the great prohibitionist in the U.S. But who's heard of Colonel Sharman, the Canadian who really was the chief architect of the whole U.N.'s war on drugs and really uh, was the guy who came up with the idea of making conspiracy to commit a drug offense a crime and was Harry Anslinger's soulmate. How many Canadians know about uh, Dr. Goodwin in the late 1800s who was the head of the Nova Scotia Medical Association who uh, uh, talked extensively about the benefits of cannabis uh, for all ail for many ailments, as well as recreational use, as well as using it to enhance sexual pleasure too. And this is like 1898, and it was a big article he had in the Nova Scotia Medical Journal talking about this. And uh, yeah, there's many stories like this that are that are really wonderful to be able to share. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, I think, even relevant today. You know, a lot of the stuff in Canada did it was similar to what happened in the United States. A lot of the racial issues. Um, and how the drug war came out of those issues as well here in Canada. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the story of prohibition in Canada, it, it's related to, but different than that in the U.S. And what I found interesting was that in the 1930s, when they finally banned cultivation of cannabis in all of its forms, uh, there's a lot of these super stories about the police busting pharmacies, busting hemp fields. They burned the hemp crops uh, in the fields in the 1930s. Uh, the farmers had no idea that this crop was a dangerous narcotic drug, they would say. And, uh, and it, it, it's, it's quite fascinating to see this history and how, they, how cannabis hemp was demonized and destroyed, the, the propaganda, the misinformation that came out, the lies that were told. And, and the book also, you know, so I started writing it 20 years ago. Well, a good portion of this book uh, took place after I started writing it. Uh, you know, the last half of it is about the modern times and profiling a lot of the activists and, and, and people uh, who had an impact now. And uh, so, yeah, I think people will be fascinated. I think it would be a great Christmas gift for the stoner in your family or for yourself. And uh, it's only 10 bucks, so it's a deal of a lifetime. No kidding. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful project. And I'm really proud of this book, and I think people will enjoy it. And Dana, the, you worked with an artist on this project. This is a, like a graphic novel style. It's completely illustrated, hand-drawn. Um, can you tell us about the art and the artist? Yeah, sure. It's, it's all illustrated in, in black and white. And he draws from a lot of original photographs, documents, a lot of portraits of people are in there. And he did a lot of original research. The guy's name is Patrick Dowers. He actually lives in Seattle. And he, he also, uh, he's done a lot of other marijuana history-related work. He, he did a book of Hemp for Victory, the American pro-hemp propaganda film that came out during World War II. Uh, years ago, and he actually worked for Cannabis Culture for a long time. He was our in-house illustrator, uh, doing all the art for us. If people remember the magazine, if they were readers mm -hmm. back in the day, we used to have those sections, Hemp, hemp uh, you know, Drug War Fun, and Hemp Horizons, and uh, MedPot Updates, and things like that. He would always do the, the cartoons for those things. He's a very talented illustrator, and he really has a good uh, archive of his own materials. He was able to get a lot of original art and original photographs of things from history and work them into the art in the book. Yeah, no, 
know, it's absolutely beautiful the way it looks. And we we have a bunch of them at Cannabis Culture right now. Dana, where else can you get the book? Is there places across Canada you, it's going to be available? Well, right now I'm in Canada, in Toronto. I'm going to be there in a couple of hours. They're doing a promotion. They're, if you become a member, they're going to give you a free copy and pay for it. So that's a, <laughs> a deal everyone would like. So if you're in Toronto uh, today or tomorrow, uh, uh, come check this out there. But uh, if you go to CannabisHistory.ca, you can order the book online uh, from our website. And while you're there, you might want to pick up a copy of Green Butts and Hash as well, my other book. Or I've got Harry Potter's Head and the Marijuana Stone being reprinted in another week, too. So you could really get all your marijuana-related book Christmas shopping done. A lot of stocking stuff. uh, Yeah, uh, uh, CannabisHistory.ca is the website where you can get the book. CannabisHistory.ca. And hopefully we'll have it in the Cannabis Culture HQ store, too, I'm yeah, I think you've got them for sale right now already uh, in Vancouver yeah. there, of course. Get them over the counter. And in fact, uh, next weekend, I'm going to be doing uh, on Saturday all day a signing promotion at the Cannabis Culture Store. And then the weekend after that, I'll be doing it again, but also promoting Harry Pothead, which will be out then as well. So if you're in Vancouver and you want to meet me and get a signed copy, come down to Mark Emery's Cannabis Culture Lounge and, uh, a store uh, next weekend uh, on Saturday, and I'll be there. Awesome, Dana. That's very cool. Now, I wanted also to talk to you uh, about big news that's happened here in the province of British Columbia. Um, It's similar to news that had happened in Ontario not too long ago, where the governmental workers union here in British Columbia, it's called the BCGEU, uh, has come out and actually made a partnership with the local private liquor stores in the province to lobby the government to ask if they can sell marijuana here in in this province. Um, now, at first, when I heard this and online, I was thinking to myself that it didn't really sound like a good idea, linking marijuana and liquor, and you know, there's a you know, there's a lot of problematic things that could come out of that sort of uh, link up. But other states like Washington State have it going on, um, and then Dana, you kind of last night gave me a few quotes and kind of changed my mind on a few points. So I thought I'd have you on well, to talk about that. Yeah, well, well, I do have issues around marijuana and alcohol being lumped together and being sold at the same spot in some ways. I don't think we should be encouraging people to do the two together. And, and, you know, cannabis is much safer than alcohol. So there's issues around that. But at the same time, there's advantages to this too. What they called for was not for a monopoly, that they're the only ones who should be able to do it. Uh, They specifically are referring to non-medical cannabis. So they advocate for the cannabis, the medical cannabis program to be separate from that. And that could include dispensaries that are operating as well. They explicitly supported home cultivation, and really they called for kind of a beer model, which we, you know, we use the wine model, the beer model. I talk about that a lot too. You know, that model means you can grow it in your own home, just like you can brew your own beer and wine in your own home. You can share it with your friends and family with no tax, no rules or restrictions on that. And if you want to sell it in a store, there's got to be labeling and requirements and safety issues, like you can't spray it with toxic pesticides and things like that. So that's all very positive in that sense. And as long as it's not limited only to those stores, I mean, the idea would also be that just like you can get a liquor license and you can have a pub or whatever, you can get a liquor license or a liquor cannabis license and only sell cannabis. So if you wanted to be a cannabis only place, you could do that. And perhaps the rules that would come out would be structured to make that process a bit different than what the one for alcohol. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also the advantage of this is that if, if we have to create separate outlets for all the cannabis sales, it means a lot of towns and municipalities will try to ban those places with bylaws and restrict them. A lot of um, cannabis unfriendly cities will make sure that no cannabis is available in their town. But if the liquor stores that are already there start selling cannabis, it's very difficult for municipalities to stop that process or to block it. And so I think that would mean a more rapid availability of cannabis to more people. Uh, It would be a positive step in many ways, I think. And as long as they're not getting a monopoly, uh, then the only issue I really have is about cannabis and, and, and alcohol being sold together because they really shouldn't be combined. But at the same time, we want cannabis to be sold at many places as possible. And so, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. But overall, I think it would be a positive step forward that would help a lot of people and get marijuana to those who need it. And uh, I think it would uh, loosen things up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be an emphasis on this idea that they don't want the monopoly. They don't want to take it away from the medical marijuana dispensaries that are there now. They want to function alongside of exactly what's happening now and really make no difference to what's happening now. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean it, would, it would alter things because you'd have a lot more options where to get your cannabis, but we're all about competition and opening right. things up. I don't think dispensaries should have a monopoly either. I no. think it should be an open thing. So, you know, we're going to see how it all goes, but I think it's certainly positive that the public debate is much more around about how we're going to sell it, where we're going to sell it, who's going to 
sell it as opposed to, you know, how many years you get in jail uh, for selling it. So I think this is a very healthy process. I'm glad that, that influential groups, the BCGEU, is a very powerful union with a lot of money and a lot of contacts. And having them come out advocating for this kind of change, I think it does our movement good. Well, and that's really one of the other big things about it is when you have a large organization that has the power that they do behind you, um, it, it really puts a lot of momentum going forward. And as you said, you know, I think there, that uh, Damien Kettlewell, who was representing the group, did say that there is um, in their plan a way that local counties could opt out if they didn't want it. He said, you know, we still have some dry counties for alcohol as well. And if they really don't want any part of it, they can. But he didn't think that that was going to happen very much because of that momentum that they have. Yeah, I mean, it's possible some municipalities that are really against could still cause problems. We're seeing that in Colorado and Washington and even California, where some cities and towns don't want these places and try to restrict them. Ultimately, that will fail, just like cities and towns can ban alcohol in Canada if they want to. But so the number that do, you can count on one hand. It's a very small uh, collection. Uh, and so, you know, we said, we'll see how it goes. I do have big feelings about it. But overall, I think it's very positive that we've got these groups coming out. You know, and they see the money in it. They see that there's going to be jobs for them and it's going to be mean opportunities for them. And there's nothing wrong with that as far as I see. Cannabis should provide jobs for all kinds of people. And so, so you know, I, I think this is a very positive step. I think it, in my research, it seems that there's a moratorium on new liquor stores opening at the moment in the province because of some other stuff that's going on with the grocery stores being allowed to um, soon carry liquor, and there's a bunch of changes happening. So I wonder, you know, if if we're moving into a model where a lot more people are going to be allowed to sell alcohol, like grocery stores, um, you know, at some point, I bet, guess that would affect the whole marijuana thing as well. Maybe we'd see marijuana in a grocery store. That would be ideal. That's what we want, really, right? We want it to be widely accessible, and they have been opening things up a lot in BC in terms of alcohol access, and, and a lot of that, those are good changes. I'm not a big fan of alcohol, but I have no problem with people being able to access it. And uh, and so, absolutely, I think that uh, you know, if we can move towards cannabis and in grocery stores, that's what we want in the long run. Uh, but it's going to be a piecemeal process, and there's going to be three steps forward and two steps back and that kind of thing as, as we move towards this. But uh, I don't think we should be complaining when a group comes out and says, hey, we want to sell marijuana legally. I think we should be happy about that. That's what we want, right? So mm-hmm. Now, Dana, yeah, of course, be, should be applauding that. you're the founder of one of Vancouver's longest-running medical marijuana dispensaries. You have two locations in town. Um, now, with the, the obvious changes coming up, um, have you put a lot of thought into how that affects the business model that's going on with you guys? Will you guys be trying to sell recreational marijuana rather than just medical, or have you? Is what's the plan? I prefer the word social or cultural marijuana than recreational myself, really. But uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, well, in our dispensary, we're, we're part of CMCB. We applied as a compassion club. We've got two locations. Probably one of them is going to be forced to shut down on, uh, because of our location. The other one, I'm hoping we can keep open. Uh, we'll see. So we applied, we applied as a compassion club, and so that restricts us to how, who, and how we can provide things. But uh, it's a very uh, changing scene in Vancouver, and I'm not sure. Ultimately, you know, I'd prefer to be able to sell cannabis to every adult who wants some and maybe offering a discount to medical users who need it. That's how the model I would prefer to have. But as it stands right now, we're still strictly medical. We're following the same protocols we followed for the last seven years, and uh, I don't think we'll be changing that any time in the immediate future. Well, cool, Dana. I really appreciate it. Um, and best of luck with the Toronto trip. I know you're slanging books over there right now. So, again, can you drop where you are in Toronto? I'm going to be at Canawide Top Shelf. It's on Baldwin Street. And uh, I'm there today uh, from 5 p.m., I think, until about 10. And then tomorrow I'm there pretty much all day from noon until 8. And then there's an after party as well. And if you come down, if you're a member or you become a member of Canawide, I'll give you a free copy, a signed copy of my book, Cannabis in Canada, The Illustrated History. So it's a great deal of a lifetime there. And, and the place the online, the name of the website, one more time? CannabisHistory.ca. You can also go to GreenBudsAndHash.com, and it'll be there as well. But CannabisHistory.ca takes you right to the book uh, website. Fantastic. Dana, thank you so much, and we'll talk again soon. All right. On. Thanks, Jared. Take care. Yeah, you too. We're eating peanuts. We're eating peanuts. Mm. So, good. Dana Larson. That was a different conversation. That was before the other one. I missed um, that. 
<laughs> you didn't hear it anyway. We were eating peanuts. Eating peanuts. I'm so talking I'm, about... Um, at the same time, I'm also... Talking about... The last interview over. Weed. Hash. And we were... Yeah, look at that gooey hash. Look at how see-through that is. Here, yeah. hold on. Let me grab the cam. Hold on, hold on. Cam, cam, cam. Hash cam. The goo cam, wait. Yeah. The pure ham. It's not really that see-through. It's pretty see-through. <clears throat> well, it's been quite a week in Canada. No it's kidding. It's been quite a week in the whole world. Mm-hmm. I haven't really been paying attention to a few things that have been happening down south. I know they're doing some pretty amazing things when it comes to terpene modulation and taking a look at how that's all going on, which is cool. I think there's a lot of new stuff that's happening with the industry. There's a lot of things are changing. There's a lot of states um, that are looking at legalization. Yeah, like it's, just, it's it's a it's happening all over the world. Mm-hmm. We're seeing Mexico. We're seeing Uruguay. Mm-hmm. Jamaica. Well. <clears throat> On the front page of Cannabis Culture right now, there's an article by Russ Belleville right. that talks about who's next in the U.S. to legalize. And he goes through all the different possibilities and who he thinks will probably be the next. And who do you think? <clears throat> I have no idea. Well, I think you're going to concentrate probably down the west side here first to slowly move their way across. Maybe New York. Mm. Nice to see Manhattan. Uh-huh. Something back east. You know, that might not happen, but... Mm. We're going right for Texas, Tennessee. I think Malaysia first. Malaysia? Mm-hmm. It'll be interesting to Maybe see China. when we start getting... Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I'm I just teasing, that, obviously. Yeah, you see stuff They'll be last. in Taiwan? I guarantee they're doing some stuff out in Taiwan. You know what I'm eating? I'm eating candy. Huh? I love candy a lot. I eat I like a lot hash. of candy because it's good. Well, mm-hmm. you know, like sour keys, sweet tarts. These ones are also sour. There's something about sour that's tasty. They're not sweet tarts. They just call, just call them sour tarts. We're talking about sour tarts and cannabis culture news. Yeah, well, it's when you smoke a lot of cannabis, me anyways, I like to enjoy the finer points in life, and candy is one of them. Love that candy. Cannabis can like have some of those tasty candy-like flavors as well, you know? I think. I like when my purple candy tastes like actual purple candy. Purple candy? <laughs> candy. Oh, uh, what is... Oh, yeah. That, the mothership? Mothership? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, it does look pretty. Um, okay, so... High integrity, aren't glass, there you go. This whole dispensary raid thing, how long is this going to go on for? How many RCMP detachments? How many local police forces? <coughs> well, I'm still curious on what's happening in Vernon. Vernon, yeah. Well, there's five dispensaries that have been threatened in Vernon. and there's Only five in Vernon. Yeah. and they. So that's every one. Yeah. Well, just like in Nanaimo, essentially, that's the same thing they did there. Yeah, it's interesting. They busted, put 16 people in jail. So what are they going to do, round two on Monday? Yeah, and they gave the people in Nanaimo longer than they needed to do it. So even though they said they were just given until today, that doesn't really mean anything. Well, they waited until they got paid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what they seemed like to do. November 30th, October 30th. Yeah, they want to steal your money, steal your stuff. It's got to be worth it. Exactly. It's all happening on the 30th. No, no. They have to make it worth it or, you know, they don't want to spend a bunch of police resources unless they're going to seize a whole bunch of your assets. Well, this way they get cash and and weed that they can actually sell on their illegal market. Yeah. Yeah. It's craziness, man. Well, Well, I'm going to figure out I was going to dab you out with one of these uh, Jamaicans. I'll take one. I know we got another video here and it's... Actually, yep. going on a long show, and both of us haven't slept. So, I, <laughs> and we're still here chatting with you guys. That's called dedication. We're just hanging, man. Today's and, been kind of like a slow you. one, but yeah, I know. We're just getting high and shit. We're getting high. He's smoking weed. <laughs> that was a great uh, Snoop Dogg. It was just like awesome. Uh, the last song when he was like, "We're just chill." It was awesome. <laughs> I still have that full video coverage that you've already released the video. 
What happens? Lack of sleep and lots of hash. Hat goes on backwards. We start rhyming and shit. Try. And yeah, it's been a real rap show for Johnny today. <coughs> well, see, now our camera looks okay. I don't know what's going on. We had some weird camera issues today. It was looking very strange, red, odd. But <coughs> what's our last we video? seem to be okay now. So the last video of the days, <coughs> Rich Scott from Nanaimo. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, that's what happens. Mm. Wouldn't be pot TV if we weren't smoking pot. Just saying. Could you watch pot TV and we'd just sit in here with no weed at all? Would you watch us? <laughs> mm. They're like, salad. Already. No. So, Rich Scott, Nature Source Society in Nanaimo, the dispensary there, raided along with um, two others. 14 people arrested? 16 people arrested? 16 people arrested. And uh, <coughs> that's the Nanaimo cops for you. Nice guys. <coughs> it's a um, pretty brutal thing that it's not just there, but it's a rash of them all over BC. And the BC RCMP or the, a bunch of RCMP are saying the raids will continue. That was their threat to the CBC this morning. Yeah, no, that's what, that's yeah. what they're going to go after. They're gonna, that's what we're saying. Yeah. And it's not just the RCMP, because we have the local forces, too. So we'll, well see in the, the end. the local forces are doing. Vancouver's the big one. If they do anything here, then we got a major. And they've already, they're well, already, they're already got people going into a whole system as an erogatory system here in Vancouver. So it's really <coughs> interesting. <coughs> um, municipality and province erogatory. I, I'm just curious what this whole government is doing. I don't like this idea of increased penalties. I'm well, not a fan. I'm going to do everything pretty much, I can it, it sounds like that'll to fight it. <clears throat> we were still well, waiting we on Judge Palin in the decision for the coalition against repeal. Yeah. Had my pen on me. Well, we got to start whipping, whipping shit up again, getting everything going, all of the activism stuff. Yeah. We thought it was going to be just an easy walk in the park. Yeah. No, nope. We're going to have to be activists still. Uh, well, apparently, we'll see how out of a job, here's the whole thing. I get out of bed every morning to do things, and Jen, who, who gets, gets out of bed and does her activism because it gives her quality of life and stuff like that, but t to do it as a job, <coughs> would you do it? <coughs> the engine. Yeah. But, you know. So this building is the engine that pushes the cause. This is the engine. One, this one is, of them. This is, this is one of the engines. It's the engine that I've been coming to for, yeah. hey, we're talking 30 plus years. I've been oh, yeah. coming to this, this area, this building, yeah. this, this well, type Mark, of location. Mark being on this block, you know, this is just where it all happened. People, when you set up a place like this, people just across the street, yeah. come to it. And because we can do no, what see, we I was want going across here, the street it's our first. little sanctuary. I was coming across the street before. Yeah, that was Hemp BC. Uh -huh. No, I was, is that what it was? Though? Yeah, Hemp BC across the street. I can't remember. Oh, what? what for, you mean I used to buy my weed in 91. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you guys came in after. No, no, I was like, no, hey, no, I'm no, coming no. here now. That's, the, that's yeah, something else. Yeah, no, I've been here yeah. for a long time. That's what I said. No, no, yeah, <laughs> that's not Mark Hammer. I've been coming here for a long time. That's some gangster shit. No, but anyways. No, this building. The, the people in this building, the, the community, and what we see yeah. happening here. Um, this has been an engine that, that has always been where, you know, I come to refuel. Yeah, man, refuel this is the engine. family. This is like our big, you know, family mansion. Ah. It's, it's the empire. The, 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 this is, this is, this is Canada's culture, yeah, mansion. Okay, it was culture mansion. Everybody's we got need, their mansion. This, we need this. a grotto. Oh. We totally need a grotto. See? Don't you think? What Pete, do you guys think? how do we design a grotto? You don't know what a grotto is? Oh, well, in Playboy magazine, the grotto, well, at the Playboy Mansion, the grotto oh. is like uh, Fuck, an that. underground cave area with pools of water where, of course, at the Playboy Mansion, you know what happens there. People much the have down. tea and a dainty time. Yeah, but... Yeah, aqua debauchery. Aqua debauchery. Botchery? Yeah. We need a grotto. We should totally do, like... See, since Playboy's not going to have any nudes in it anymore, that's the thing we forgot to mention when David was waving around his Playboy magazine. Playboy magazine is going to be sans nude. 
Well, that's crazy. What I heard. Bless you. you. That's really cute. You sound Let's like an, to 8 p.m. on the Playboy Mansion. An angelic chipmunk or something. You is followed by around by not <laughs> Playboys like an anymore. He's, he, he has a team of nurses that walk him around the mansion. Who, Hef? Yeah. He's got a team of nurses, He's yeah. He's got a team of nurses now, like, to keep him alive, stuff like that. <laughs> Bless you. I, I listen to your. So I listen to American radio, so I heard the whole thing about Hugh and him shouting down and stuff. Now he's old. Yeah, he's well, done. It's not. That's and not no why they're took doing over it. His industry. It's so. not because he's too old, and that's they can't get naked anymore because half's too old. He's just it's, no, no, no. The reason that they're getting rid of the nudity and get this, this is a kind of interesting thing from a media studies nerd perspective, which I am. I love media studies, but it's format changes. That's why. You know why? It's because Facebook doesn't allow nudity on it. <coughs> and so nobody <coughs> can share around Playboy magazine stuff if it's got not safe for work stuff because Facebook will block it. So they had to remove all the nudity and they went to a completely non-nude website and they just did really well as that. And so they're like, let's just get rid of it completely. And they're going, they're going to a totally non-nude everything. Interesting. I wasn't much of yeah, they might. Nah. Well, Playboy's always had a pretty good readership because they actually do have uh, so it'll be paid blue online. great writers, classy people, contributors of a higher caliber than your average, you know, so I have a your average stroke book, that is. 627. Mm -hmm. oh. Playboy was never pornography. It was art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Enticement. Yeah. It was meant to be an appreciation of the female form. Which and at the time it came out, it was revolutionary. It was meant to be liberating for women. Women weren't allowed to be, you know, sexually liberated and naked. celebrate their own sexuality and be naked and do all the things. No, they weren't. And it was like, you know, a super repressive time. So, and that's what they actually said. The reason, one of the reasons they're not doing the nudity anymore is because everywhere there's nudity now and women don't. But I kind of disagree in a way. I think everywhere there's cheap ass stuff. And actually, if you look at Playboy, you know, all the stuff that Playboy became after like 1980 or 90 was just a bunch of bubblegum garbage. You know, no, I don't want to be rude or anything, but a lot of synthetic looking girls, you know, like. The super plasticky Barbie look, all the same, pretty much all white, blonde. Big tits. You know, so they, they're trying to, like, celebrate something. It wasn't really diversity. <coughs> Why don't they actually, like, instead of just getting rid of nudity completely and then they have a bunch of the same bimbos in it, why don't they, like, spread the love and put some real people in I'm there? I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to know. find more... Pe different looking people. Magazines or illustrations by Googling. I don't know. Maybe I'm just talking out of my ass. I, don't know. I have quite a collection of Playboy magazines, though. Do you? I have a complete shelf of them. Nice. Old ones. No, nah, I'm thinking, I still I'm look thinking at them. in the magazines that got thrown away in my mm. flood. And mine were all uh, pop magazines and. Um, Truck magazines and, and all the girls and all of the trucks, all my old trucking magazines. Now I had I had all my trucks and stuff like that. So now we're talking about our magazine stash, stuff like that. I had all the yeah, lots of cannabis culture ones, uh, all the TY ones, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I still have a lot of the books. Not they didn't get wrecked, but um, we should. Did we listen to the ending yet? No, we didn't. <laughs> no, we got carried away. You know but we're going to. Um, yeah. And yeah, and actually, when we do, I think that'll be the end of the show. Um, so now, what I'll do when we play the interview... That's it. Wait. That's it. Is there anything playing there? No. I'm just tripping. I, I know. I'm like... I really am tripping out. I keep hearing things. I'm worried about my... I am tripping out. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm hearing voices. No, it's... Bear is it your slap. thing? That's what it is. It's that. That's hilarious. What? I knew that something was going over there. I really thought my computer was making the noise, and I'm like, how is that happening? That's hilarious. <laughs> um, okay, so look at what's going on here. Every time I try and open this, the, what I'm actually doing here is struggling with this PC that every time you open 
a damn window, it completely maximizes the entire thing. You have to like go and drag it down to another damn small window. There's no way to like make it go small again, like as a default. I don't know, it's a bunch of goddamn windows. I hate it. Can't make it go small? Um, eight, uh, eight? I don't know. Or wait, yeah, eight. It's eight. Uh, I don't know. So apparently we're having problems figuring stuff out here. Who, what, oh, the video? No, 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 I'm just getting it. It's right here. One no hate. But yeah, anyways, this is Rich Scott. Now, um, this, oh, shit. Arr, arr, arr. What's that, Rich See Scott? again. It always gets so large. Yeah, this is the Rich Scott interview. Um, now, he really had to go through some shit in this one, and this guy's a hardcore trooper. He's put in a lot of, uh, putting a lot of work on this one, and the, the place that he has over there, I like Nanaimo. I was born and raised there. Yeah, I know you the place that he has is a really cool spot, right down close to the waterfront, and it's a beautiful building. It used to be a stripper club, actually, called The Globe. But now it's quite a nice building, and he's restored it and done a lot of work on it and stuff. And so this guy's, like, been, you know, contributing to the community. He's restored this building and done stuff. And, like, you know, these all these people that are... It's just, like, 420. All the people that are there selling bring this worth. All those cannabis dispensaries that are there in town, and the same with here in Vancouver, all those 120 cannabis dispensaries are providing jobs to people, are providing a service, a huge economy. They all bring a massive amount of worth with them. Um, so just thinking that they're going to go- come through and sweep through and eradicate them, that's a really brutal thing to do d- to your own city. It's, it's arrogant. Yeah, it is arrogant. To me, it seems wrong. It just seems like these guys are completely, I mean, again. It's just everything they do about it. They hit them on the 30th most of the time. They've already paid the rent for the next month. They're taking all their sales. They're taking all their, like, they're just really being pricks. They're cr- well, they're being dirty about it. You know what I mean? Like, fuck. Yeah, they are dirty about it. Well, they seem angry. They're angry cops. And again, it's this rogue behavior or whatever. They just kind of like do whatever they want. Um, well, you guys are going to listen to this? and um, Yeah, and then I guess uh, we'll say I'm goodbye. Not. We should, yeah, this will be the end of it. So we'll, because what, look what time it is. It's already 6.30. This video is not that long, but we're going to end the show now. And... Uh, I got 20 minutes for parking, so I'm good to go. Oh, you got your parking deal. Oh, no, All I right. paid for five hours to park in the lot right here. So I still got half <laughs> an hour. Johnny's learned his lesson Yeah, I learned now. my lesson. Tickets and everything. Lesson I just paid my last one. Lesson after oh, lesson. I just paid my last ticket, $130 for what? Remember? What? The no. cop and the, for the July 1st uh, riot. They gave me the $130 oh, yeah. dollar, uh, ticket. <clears throat> for, oh, yeah. not, for stopping for, in a no-stopping yeah, zone. Yeah, on the street. So, uh, how could what I move? Bastard. You were parked in front of me in a fucking bike. That was that made no sense. So I took it. I lost in court. <coughs> I said, what? I said, well, how can I win? Oh, that then there was ridiculous. a parking ticket when there was a riot going on. And because I couldn't move my car during a riot, they gave me a parking ticket? Yeah. yeah. Well, cops do whatever they want to. And so do the cities, your government, and um, your dad. Okay. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> I'm falling asleep with my eyes open. There you go. Love you, Pod TV. We'll see you again next Friday. Peace, guys. <clears throat> Lots of good stuff on Pod.TV. Yeah, our websites are back up and running again. We're on the new server. Everything's great. We're pr- DDoS protected. Weekend. It's all very nice. It's running very fast. And uh, really? lots of new content coming, so keep watching. And we'll see you again soon. Peace, guys. Peace. Have a good one. Enjoy. This is Rich Scott. Nanaimo. I like this. Here you go. Ready? Well, <laughs> Jeremiah here with Rich Scott, manager of the Nature Source Society in Nanaimo. Um, Rich, we had you on the show a couple weeks ago when this Nanaimo dispensary stuff started heating up. Um, when the police, local RCMP, went around to 10 dispensaries and handed out these eviction notices, basically, or saying, if you don't shut down, we're going to come here and shut you down. Um, last time, or last week on the show, or was it last week or a couple weeks now, you guys had your big event over there in Nanaimo, a cup, and then yeah. you guys started getting hit. Craziness. And it was on Saturday, Saturday that we had the Mid-Island Cannabis open, 
Uh, it was a great turnout. It was a great show. There was no problems. Um, just like any other cannabis event, there's no violence, no issues at all. Um, then subsequently on December 1st, they actually executed the search warrant. And uh, upon uh, the search warrant, they stole about $10,000 worth of um, uh, product and cash. And I use the word stole because it's already been clearly mandated by the federal government that we're going to go forward with the legalization. So them concentrating all of their resources on busting these peaceful pot shops is kind of just a, a redundant point. Um, there will be no conviction guaranteed. There's already been legal precedent set on this. So why are they wasting their resources on um, doing the investigation in the first place? And then once they do the investigation, they just are stealing money and product from a, a peaceful business. And now, I mean, what is it that the cops are saying? They're, they're basically just saying, you guys are illegal. Yeah, they're saying the law is the law, and that's all there is to it. But really, the we, the people, the citizens of this country have already decided that the law is um, just kind of archaic and, and just kind of ridiculous, to quote the judge from Quebec. Um, it's just ridiculous that they're going to go through these uh, extents. It's like they're rushing around trying to bust the pot shops while they can. Yeah, exactly. Their last hurrah. Yeah, they're picking at the low-hanging fruit because it's easy points for them. Well, and it really is. They're going after the sick and dying people. I mean, it's pathetic. Yeah. And so yeah, no- well, uh, as well as the sick and dying, just the businesses that are operating in an open, honest manner. We're all being very polite to courteous neighbors, to all of our neighbors. And so it's not very hard for them to build a case and come in and bust us because we're not trying to hide. Right. We're exactly. trying to be part of society. We're not trying to be criminals. Now, how many dispensaries were hit the second round, like when they actually started arresting people? There was three dispensaries that they executed the search warrants at, and subsequently 16 people were arrested, some of them being um, employees, some of them being volunteers, some of them being patients or clients, I should say. Wow. Wow. And so, I mean, that's a lot of people to arrest at just three dispensaries. Oh, yeah. We basically filled Nanaimo City cells for a full day. It was about eight hours to process us. No way. Unbelievable. And it all happened at the exact same moment kind of thing. You guys were all there together. Yeah. Yeah, they blanketed the three places pretty quick. and It was it was executed in a very crossing T's and dotting I's uh, fashion as long as people were um, there watching. But as soon as there was nobody in the building, they were doing the same old what the police do, high-fiving each other, fist-pumping. They even sat down in my restaurant and had lunch. Wow, so it... It basically, it's a lot of unprofessionalism from the Nanaimo RCMP. Yes, I would say that it was not very professional. Um, they appear professional when you're face to face. They'll smile as they're stealing your money. Yeah, yeah. Well, and even how this started when they first came around, the letters they handed out weren't on an, an official letterhead or anything like that. It looked like they had just printed it off and hand scribbled parts of it. Yeah, it really does look like it's a spearhead of a few right-wing um, Harper stormtroopers, um, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better description. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and hasn't the mayor come out and said that there's nothing he can do about it? Well, I can't really say um, why he, uh, Bill McKay is not stepping in. There's lots of speculation whether Till Ray might have something to do with it, but I, I don't want to speculate on what the facts are around that. He's just is sticking by his gun that it's not his duty to step in and interfere with police investigation. But right. there has been municipal uh, precedent set in other uh, circumstances where the municipalities have asked RCFP to stand down. And subsequently, they will listen to the municipality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I know he did mention to the press, I saw a quote from him saying, oh, well, you know, we hand it all over to them, so we don't have any jurisdiction over it. But I have heard, of course, I mean, there's always something that can be done. And, you know, even just, I mean, and look at what we have in Vancouver going on. I mean, they've even oh. made regulations where they've passed it through city council. Um, so, I mean, there's Victoria obviously something the council can do. Yes, same with Victoria. 
they just recently um, went through legis- uh, regulation. Um, so it's, it's actually quite a bit cheaper, only $5,000 to register your, um, your cannabis dispensary yeah. down in Rather Victoria. Than- the 30000 they want in Vancouver, yeah. Correct, yeah. And Port Alberni just actually voted uh, on city council to go ahead and um, allow the dispensaries to open up. Subsequently, We Medical has moved out there, and Lime Life has just uh, secured a place there. Wow, so now they've gone after you. They've, you know, robbed you of a bunch of your stuff. Are you guys now still open, or what's the current status of the biz? Oh, we're going to stay strong. Um, it's a bit of a struggle. Um, they just hit us quite hard financially but and uh, unfortunately a great deal of the staff um, is uh, either been uh, ordered not to come around with their conditional release or they have been scared off so there's very few of us left it's just a skeleton crew that is mm-hmm. willing to be arrested for their cause no kidding well and that's what it really comes down to is who you know can be arrested also you might have a family you might have other obligation things like work that you just can't be so yeah Yeah. i myself have seven children um but i'm really sticking to my guns Uh, i'm behind justin trudeau with his mandate to legalize um it's unfortunate that he's busy with world affairs and he can't deal with the and the, the reality is that um in the grand scheme of things, he has a lot on his plate. He has put forth the mandate to uh, go forward with the legalization, but unfortunately, he's too busy to um, oversee it himself, I'm guessing. Well, you know, I'm starting to wonder because um, in a little bit of research I was doing over the past couple of days, just digging up quotes from liberals, they're making it sound as if uh, the, you know, what was the quote? Well, they're, they're kind of sounding like the Nanaimo RCMP and saying, well, it's illegal, so we have to follow the law. They're outside of the framework and this kind of stuff. Um, so oh. some of those quotes are a little scary. There's an article on the front page of Cannabis Culture right now that contains some of those ones. Um, but, but you know, I, I not that I'm, I'm a liberal member myself. I really hope that the liberal government does what's right on this and doesn't just abandon you guys and leave you guys in the cold. Um, you know, there's a lot of speculation that they want to go to this LP model Especially because even um, Rafisi there is the was the uh, what was he the chief financial officer of the Liberal Party he was the co-founder of Tweed as well, and sits on the board of Aurora and other things. So you know there's some ties there that are a little strange, but uh, you never know. I think that hopefully you're right, and that Justin's just busy doing other stuff right now, and he's going to come through with a really swift form of legalization quickly. <laughs> yes, and and. Um, there's been many reports also um, on suggestions from Colorado uh, and the mistakes that they made. One of them is um, that they took too long and debated on this, that, and the other thing, and it really hurt the bottom line when it comes to the uh, the industry and the taxation and the revenue that could be created from it. Well, absolutely. And even in Washington, the same thing happened with stalling on um, distribution and all that kind of thing. It really took a long time to get the system set up and a lot of people just have to go to the black market till then. Um, Correct. That's another thing. Um, they, they've re, rethought the uh, 43% um, tax because uh, it subsequently makes the price so high that it's cheaper to go to the black market. And because it's legal, it's easier to hide the black market. Right. So they've uh, decided to relook the uh, taxation of it and maybe bring it down to a reasonable level so then people will, instead of going to the black market, they will actually go to the legitimate stores. Mm-hmm. I know it would be in a crazy thing to do to you know, decriminalize it, but not provide a new system of distribution um, and access for people because then you're just basically giving a giant gift over to organized crime and things exactly. like that. Yeah, wow. Well, you guys are amazing in Nanaimo there. So now the other dispensaries too, I mean, there's still dispensaries that are operational in Nanaimo at the moment. Yes, oh yeah, there, we've all decided to stay open. I think that there was one that closed down. Um, he was just a smaller guy, but uh, Mid-Island Wellness is open, to that's my knowledge. I know for a fact Trees Dispensary is open, and I also know that We Medical has stayed open. Mm-hmm. Phoenix Pain Management is open. And you guys have formed the Nanaimo Cannabis Coalition as a way to sort of get everybody on the same page and fight that's back right. against what's going on there. Is there a way people can help you guys? Um, 
the best way I could uh, say to help us is just support your local dispensary and and um, keep on uh, coming in so we can pay our rent. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Without, without the customers, there is no business. That's right. Well, I really appreciate you coming on and giving us an update. Um, now, what have the police, they've continued, I, I know there was a CBC story that had a really ominous headline saying the crackdown will continue and that the cops are still making more threats. Do you know what they're, what the police are saying now? Well, they've expanded their, uh, their um, stormtrooper tactics to Vernon now, apparently. They've given out the same seven-day cease and desist order over there. And, mm-hmm. uh, I'm suspecting that if the, the cannabis ventures over there don't shut down, then uh, we'll probably have a search warrant. There's a particular judge over in Burnaby that's uh, enjoying signing these. Yeah, and there's the um, Seashelt and Mission now, I believe, yep. as well. And, of course, there was Halifax just a few days ago. We had Saskatoon as well. So, you know, it's not just in B.C., but, yeah, there's. it seems to be that the, it's the, uh, jurisdiction is in the hands of local police forces. So you get kind of a wild card thing where you got the, the police chief of Vancouver totally supportive of the idea of outright legalization, and then you got a bunch of backwater hillbilly cops who hate that marijuana stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right wing stormtroopers. Exactly. Well, Rich, I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, definitely um, keep in touch. Is there a uh, Facebook page that you